It's time for Windows Weekly. Paul Theroux here. Richard is in transit, so he'll miss today's show. But we have lots of stuff Paul loves to talk about. Things like AI, Xbox. We heard a lot about Xbox's plans for the future. Some hot new games coming out on Game Pass. Of course, Windows 11. And Microsoft's finally announced the dates for Paul's very favorite trade show. All that and more coming up next on Windows Weekly. <laughs> Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Windows Weekly with Paul Therott, episode 869, recorded Wednesday, February 21st, 2024. Pretty, pretty bueno. Windows Weekly is brought to you by Miro. Miro is one incredible visual place that brings all of your innovative work together no matter where you're located. We're talking six whole capability bundles from product development workflows to content visualization and more. And it's powered by Miro AI, which means you're constantly generating new ideas or summarizing complex information. Miro connects seamlessly to the platforms you're already using, like Jira, Confluence, Google, Asana. So you centralize work in a way that makes sense for your team. They don't need to leave Miro to update projects or statuses in any of those tools. You could do it all through Miro. Miro users report saving up to 80 hours per year because they streamline conversations, cut down on meetings, and see all the most up-to-date information in one place. Miro has a board video recording feature now called Talk Track, where you can record your thoughts and leave them on the board instead of scheduling yet another meeting. Go on, try it for yourself. Get your first three boards for free to start working better at Miro.com slash podcast. That's M-I-R-O dot com slash podcast. It's time for Windows Weekly, the show we cover the latest news from Microsoft. Paul Therott is here, therott.com, leanpub.com for his books, visiting us from beautiful Mexico City, where he makes his home. I like that. I like saying that. Where he makes his home. He's survived by his wife and two children. Yes. <laughs> we did have an earthquake square, a scare the other day. Did you? Yeah. Mexico yeah. City's famous for uh, bad earthquakes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's all right. You'll be fine. I guess so. I don't think the building already sways when trucks drive by. So I can only imagine. <laughs> That's a good thing. You don't want it to be rigid. You want it to rock. I know, but it's, you know, it's like when we were on the cruise, like you're, you're laying in the bed and it kind of. Oh, that's a weird feeling. I know. goes back and forth. And you're like, is that a truck? Are we going to roll over? That's what I always think. Are we going to, are we going to actually roll over and it'll be like mm -hmm. the Poseidon adventure. A perfect storm or something. And yeah, Richard, exactly. And uh, Ernest Borgnine's going to run in my room and say, Shelly Winters wants you in the kitchen. That sounds like a bad dream. I nice. Had. Might have had that. <laughs> yep. Anyway, yeah, you might have Robert noticed Richard. Richard's not here. He is, uh, we don't know what happened to him. He, I think he got on an upside down boat. I don't know. He's, uh, isn't he supposed to be in Puerto Vallarta today? I can't remember. I wouldn't have remembered that until you said it, but I, I, I can't keep track of this guy. He's like, where in the world is Richard Campbell? <laughs> he was in Sydney um, before that. Taranga, New Zealand. Um, I think PV. Anyway, flight delayed. He's driving as fast as he can down the fine high quality mexican highway i will never know but <laughs> here he comes we'll see so he'll show up maybe maybe not uh doesn't matter because i got you babe and mm -hmm. i am i am ready to do a show and as it turns out uh this is right up your alley because <laughs> you may remember if we talked about last week phil spencer felt compelled to explain what's going on yes. with xbox my favorite part about this event, which was last Thursday, was that he literally started by saying when we were planning this back in December, all we were going to talk about was what we were doing with Activision Blizzard. And I could feel the little bell go off, you know, ding, 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 you won the, you know. And uh, that was what, that was my kind of expectation. Uh, but because of all the rumors about, you know, cross-platform and everything, uh, they felt compelled to uh, talk about that stuff first. But when I, when I looked at this, um, I, I don't think that was all that important, frankly, uh, we'll get to it, but, 
Um, a lot of it was just a reiteration of strategy that has been in place for a long time. I know there was a lot of angst and kind of hand wring, you know, the past week or two. I hope everyone feels better, right? Because I think this went great and I think they're doing the right thing. Um, unfortunately, they are being vague on the specifics of Activision Blizzard because we know now that the first of those games will appear on Game Pass on March 24th, which is seriously March 24th? Come on. And then we don't know anything beyond that. So does that mean we get like one game a week or, you know, who knows? We, I mean, I, I suppose it's understandable they want to milk this, spend the rest of the year. Oh, here's a new one. Here's a new one. You know, so we'll probably have a lot of that. Um, but they reiterated some things and, and kind of confirmed that they, they apply to uh, Activision Blizzard, which I think is important. So, for example, all first party Xbox games will appear on Game Pass on day one. And that does include Activision Blizzard and ZeniMax and everything else they own. Right. So um, to me, that's that's important. I, I would have understood if that wasn't the case, I think. They might have complicated matters. Otherwise, you'd imagine a situation where, say, the next Call of Duty was purchased only for the first month or two. I mean, I think a lot of Game Pass fans might have revolted over that kind of a thing. Um, because of the cross-platform rumors and also some of the realities there, um, they dropped this kind of a bomb. I'll call it a Game Pass will only be available on Xbox, right? Now, we got to be careful about what that means because... What is what is Xbox? I mean, what is Xbox, right? Um, I think for a lot of people, Xbox is the console, but that's not what Xbox is, right? Xbox is this platform, this ecosystem. So we have Game Pass on the PC, but that's considered Xbox, right? So I think that this is a a moving target. And I think that this might evolve to include other platforms in the form of such things as a Game Pass mobile that may appear on iOS if they can ever get their act together there. It's maybe Europe only. We'll see how those things evolve. Um, and I don't think it precludes uh, Game Pass coming to other consoles, frankly, because, you know, this is the whole mantra, like we're going to meet gamers where they are. So we'll see, but uh, that's kind of where that's at. Um, exclusivity, uh, it's been a long thing. I mean, uh, ever since there's been a PC play, uh, in the most recent era, we've been concerned about what it means to be exclusive. Sony obviously has exclusives. They're doing a great job uh, compared to Xbox. Um, we have Xbox exclusives in the Microsoft space, but they, again, they're, it's Xbox ecosystem. Um, he explained a lot of things I don't, I wish didn't need explaining. I had written about this myself when I saw all of the angst and everything uh, about people uh, benefiting no matter what platform they play on when games are in more places, right? You have people to play with, people to play against, but your audience, et cetera, it's better for creators, the people that make the games, uh, more players, et cetera, et cetera, right? So, I mean, I, this is, it's not really new, but it's, you know, it's, I feel like people need to have it kind of drilled into their head a little bit. Um, fans of Windows will appreciate this kind of variation on the Windows, only Windows first, Windows best strategies of the past. Um, they tried to push this notion that, A, they're not getting out of hardware. Uh, B, that Xbox will always offer the best experience on Xbox hardware. And they actually talked a little bit about next-gen hardware. Now, we know there are refreshes coming, right, to the current consoles. But what they're talking about here is the next-gen, the thing that comes later. And uh, they referred to this as the largest technical leap you have ever seen in a hardware generation. Oh, come so, on. <laughs> I know. I know. That was a little hard to accept. I, uh, I, hate I feel it like when we're running out of superlatives well, in a case like that. It's like, okay, just say it's yeah, a big I, jump or something. Right. So here, so look, you could, the nice thing about that statement is you could, it could mean anything, right? So for example, if Microsoft moves to ARM, right, which is one of the, the rumors, uh, not a rumor, that was one of the leaks but as a possibility. If Microsoft moves to ARM and or NPU hardware in this thing, I mean, you could argue that this meets that definition. I mean, I think, you know, in games, we have uh, very standard concerns, which we've had for a long, long time. And it always kind of boils down to resolution and frame rate, frankly. And then, of course, latency if you're playing online and things like ray tracing, I guess we'll just call it quality, like quality of graphics. I, I think we hit a wall, not just in Xbox, but just in gaming with hyper-realistic graphics and the need to have 
a Hollywood style movie production uh, budget to make these games. And that maybe Nintendo, if they could teach us anything as an industry, is that, you know, the game matters a lot. Maybe focus on that first and that uh, we kind of navel gaze over these little spec things. But it's not like we're going to 8K60 for the next gen, right? That that would be a huge technical leap, but I don't think we need it. And I don't think it's going to happen either. So it's hard to say what they meant by that because that sentence I read was the whole thing they said about it. <laughs> so there's not a lot of details. Um, I do like they talked a lot about what they call game library preservation. This is the Xbox backward compatibility stuff. This notion that if you buy a game digitally, especially they tried to figure out physical, weren't able to do that, but you buy a game digitally and it comes forward with you. Right. And one of the things that came out after this show was this notion that this stuff is all going to probably end up on game streaming, uh, cloud streaming, meaning that if you have this library of games that goes back, you know, possibly the OG Xbox, uh, you'll be able to play these things in the future. So there's some way forward for you as an Xbox fan. I think that's hugely important. Um, obviously, they didn't get into specifics about the next gen. There are issues with compatibility when you switch chipsets, right? We went from uh, an Intel uh, Celeron in the first gen to PowerPC back to an AMD x86 type chip in the two most recent generations. It's almost certainly going to change again. And, th and there are challenges there, obviously. But, you know, they're big on uh, cross play, cross save, cross progression, backward compatibility, this whole kind of notion of uh, what makes Xbox unique and special, I think, is um, is awesome. So then they, uh, not then, actually, now I will. <laughs> they actually put this up front because of all the speculation. And I didn't like the way they did this. They were forced to, right? They weren't ready to say this. But basically what they admitted at the time, right up front in the show, was that they are going to bring four games to other consoles, was how they described it. Not a big change in this strategy, not a, anything about whatever. It just, you know, but they, did, they didn't say what those games were. And uh, the idea was that the studios in charge of them were getting ready to make their own announcements. He did say, Phil Spencer did say, neither of those was Starfield or Indiana Jones, right? Um, but he also gave these kind of interesting hints about the types of games, right? Um, th these aren't the big franchise games. Like I would have guessed, if you had said, I'm going to bring four games from the Xbox stable, cross-platform that are not today cross-platform. I would have said Halo, Gears of War, Flight Sim, maybe a Forza game, that kind of thing. No, these are smaller games. These are games that they looked at and said, you know, th there's a service-based component to this. There are communities that love these games. They're smaller typically. They're, they were never really meant to be platform exclusives, you know? Um, and their games, we the Xbox felt, deserved more of a chance to, um, to kind of get out in the world. Now, today, just before the show started, they just announced what those games were. So I don't know what they think. I guess six days was enough. Um, and those games are Sea of Thieves, right? Which was one of the ones I had guessed uh, after that fact. Uh, Hi-Fi Rush, which I've never really even heard of. Grounded and Pentiment. And Pentiment is a game I'm actually pretty familiar with. So I had, what did I guess? I had guessed. Let me see if I can find this. I guess knowing that it wasn't Forza Halo, et cetera, I'd guess Sea of Thieves and maybe as Dusk Falls, but... Those are the four games. So they came out today and said that that's uh, what's happening. And they're coming to Sony and Nintendo, right? Uh, although not all of them on each. And obviously we have to have a confusing matrix of availability because that's what we do. Anywho, I hope that other than kind of the, some of the vague stuff, right? Um, you know, the, the the biggest technical leak we're, we're ever seen in a hardware generation, right? Hilarious. Um, and I don't know. You know, uh, we don't know when Activision Blizzard, I'm still, it's like, you've been talking, they've been talking about this internally since December. And the only thing they were able to announce three months later was Diablo 4 on March 24th. Like, guys, come on. Like, we need, I'm not saying you have to lay out the schedule, but there must be an idea of how this stuff is going to come up. So we just don't know what that is. Anyhow, we'll have more Xbox news at the, as we always do, but I wanted to throw this one up front because. Um, this was kind of the day of destiny for Xbox fans anyway. And as they reiterated a bunch of times, I don't, I really, I don't see much has changed from a strategy perspective. It's just that now they have an incredible stable of first party games. And so they were at least able to, um, to verify that all the first party stuff would continue to be available in game pass on day one, which is neat. So whenever the next call of duty comes out, 
I guess we'll get that on Game Pass. We'll see what the sales look like. They're probably like, I, I'm guessing Game Pass sales are going to go up and Call of Duty sales are going to go down, but we'll see. Do you think Microsoft's given up on trying to beat PS5 with Xbox? Yeah. yeah. They know they're just, yeah, gonna, PS5's just going to win. And so might as well put their stuff on PS5. I was surprised how emphatic they were that Xbox doesn't exist without the console. Um, oh, that's an interesting point. You're right. I think it's yeah. a it's one of those marketing things, right? You you can't Osborne the platform, right? right. Um, and there's no, I mean, there's no way that the long term strategy is less and less reliance on the console. I, the one argument I could make to keeping this stuff afloat, although it's super expensive to do the R and D and everything is that now that they have all these Activision Blizzard games, they have something that can subsidize it essentially, right? right? I mean, right. this is the thing they didn't have before. And Microsoft, you know, it's hard to line these things up, but they've launched new consoles without a new Halo title at day one. Like that, to me, those things should always be aligned. And because they only have a handful of Exclusives. super popular yeah. first party games, right? Yeah. Now they have more, a, right. lot more, a lot more, and maybe it doesn't matter. Yeah. So, I mean, but they did say we're going to make another console. We're going to make another one. It's going to be yeah. the best one ever. Uh, so, of course, it is. <laughs> they're still involved <laughs> in the hardware, even though it's a money loser for them, right? The yeah, games are. Yeah. The games aren't. Software's not. Or is so, it? So, uh, one thing I. So, I've been reading Stephen Snofsky's book. And um, I, was, I can't. There's no jokes to be made here that are in any way polite. <laughs> so, I'll just say. I'm trying to think how do I say this? <laughs> Oh, don't be uh, polite. I, Why bother? I've ex no. Well, I'm thinking more. I mean, uh, even more from sort of a personal perspective. I, I there's no doubt that I experienced some form of PTSD from this guy and the shabby way he treated people like Mary Jo and I. Um, I avo studiously avoided this book for a variety of reasons because uh, I didn't want to relive it again, you know. But yeah. then, you know, I think maybe I talked about this last week. I'm sorry if I'm repeating myself, but the yeah, look, if you care about windows as much as i do i mean you have to you have to you have to so i read it and i've got tourettes over there i'm screaming at nobody and you know uh, as i'm reading it and all the mistruths and the bizarre interpretations of events but he was inside microsoft but anyway one of the things and there are these little facts that kind of come out he talks about you know he's verified a lot of the stuff i've said about microsoft continually fighting the web as a platform and losing and um they knew that so long ago and they just kept going and it 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 and he saw that as a huge mistake. So I actually, I mean, I certainly agree with him on some things. Anyway, one of the little tidbits that he came out with was that Xbox has never made money. And if it wasn't for the console, they it's sort of a break-even business, is the way he described it. So, you know, if it was just software, it would probably be doing pretty well. And obviously these days with just software, with Activision, Blizzard, Zenimax, et cetera, that's a, that's a pretty solid business right there, you know? So, so how yeah, important that, is it they make their own hardware at all? I mean, is it just I pride? believe that, yeah. No, I think it honestly has to do more with fans. I, yeah. And I just based on my own inter, interaction with people who just, there are certain kind of religious topics in our industry. Yeah. Um, the Chromium web render is one where people just, I mean, they line up and they just la, 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 la. They don't listen. They don't, no one's seeing both sides of it. It, it, it and you know, I, I, arguably the the certification stuff. Uh, well, that's I think most people kind of agree with that. But I, there are these things where people just kind of you know, uh, uh, walled garden ecosystems versus open ecosystems, and people feel very strongly about one side or the other, and they have a hard time seeing the other side of it. And I think in the Xbox world, gamers, console players, uh, the Xbox is not a thing unless there's a console. You know, and um, whether Microsoft internally believes that to be true or not. I don't think they do. I do think they believe that enough people would leave if they, if they announced today, we're not doing any more consoles. I think the business might start to tank Yeah, just because so many people would walk away. Yeah. So I think they need time to, to, to show people how, you know, some, there'll become a day someday where you'll be able to stream your entire Xbox library of games from the past onto a, a PlayStation probably, you know, and it will be an eye-opening moment for people where they realize that the platform that they thought was a piece of hardware, which hardware. they very explicit was yeah. not, yeah. is not, it's this yeah. other thing, you know? Yes. Yeah, there's it's, no net. It's Sorry. weird for me when you say Xbox and I'm including the hardware in this, like there's a something, stand, but there is, and that's, I think it's I an important context. 
It's, Phil Spencer is quoted in the Financial Times this morning mm -hmm. complaining about Apple. Uh, <laughs> yep. and, uh, We're going to get to this. Yeah. yeah. This so is, I'm just wondering, uh, does my, Sony charges Microsoft 30%, right, when, they sell, when, they, when you buy a game on PS5? I would think so, yeah. Yeah, and vice versa. But mm -hmm. that's pretty much the flow is mostly towards Sony on that. Um, yeah, but uh, well, so the big ar the the argument there, of course, is you know what kind of a hypocrite do you have to be to complain to right. the European regulators right. that some platform is charging you thirty percent when that's what you charge? And the reason that's not hypocritical is that antitrust requires scale, and um, right. there are the twenty to fifty million Xbox consoles in active right. use. There are sixty to hundred million PlayStation consoles right. in active use. There are two billion iPhones in active use. So, or whatever the number is, it's billions. It's an order of magnitude bigger. And that's that's when antitrust kicks in. The The other thing is that the business model for the iPhone is not contingent on we sell this hardware to loss and then we make right. it up to you with, with the razor blades. Uh, that's how the console market, which is a much smaller market, works. Right. It's, the, it's kind of an implicit contract. I mean, this is, if we sold this thing for what it costs, no one would buy it. But um, so, but sounds like Microsoft's content, at least in the in the game sphere, to to, to give Sony thirty percent more and more. I mean, if they didn't have yes. any hardware, so, that would be all one way. Well, right. So think about the different kind of parts of that puzzle, right? So you're Microsoft, you're Xbox, which you know again a lot of people see as a console that's competing with the Sony console. But Xbox is a much bigger thing than that. And the console not only is in many ways, the smallest piece of that puzzle, it's the part that loses money. It's the part that drags on everything else. If it wasn't for that, this business would be incredibly uh, profitable, right? So their deal is like, look, we this will benefit our console gamers because now they'll have these people they can play with a much wider audience because they'll be cross-platform, the, the games. Um, we as a publisher can spread this game further. And even though we are taking a 30% hit, on Sony or Nintendo, whatever those fees are, it's, it's still more profitable than the console. I mean, it it, it, we, we, it sells at such volume compared to consoles and uh, potentially, and it's so much less expensive to make. It, it's it, the, the whole cost structure of this is just a completely different thing. So yeah, they, they've done some gymnastics here to understand what they're going to bring where and what, and look, I, there's a lot of things you can't come out and say too early in a cycle and ruin the sales of the thing you're already making, right? So it, I don't think anyone should doubt that they would like to get rid of the hardware long-term, but realize they can't. I don't think anyone should doubt the fact that this is an experiment that if, if it goes well, we're going to see more games, right? I mean, of course. Um, and I, I think they want to focus more on the high volume, lower margin products and services in Xbox than the low margin money losing hardware which is, you know, something we see elsewhere at Microsoft too, right? With Surface and Windows and so forth. So it's, you can't just say we're done with, you know, with hardware. You can't just say we're done with only putting games on the con our console. Uh, but you, you know, you make little inroads and we'll see. We'll see what happens. Well, they're obviously investing. I mean, it must cost billions to do the R&D to develop the yeah, next billions. generation. I know. Of, uh, what, I know. Right? Well, especially if it's going to be a leap you've ever seen <laughs> a, what do you think? a technical leap of this kind. Do you think they I, might be looking at Vision Pro and saying, hey, what if we did it as a VR thing? No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> actually. They're done. That? And, and, well, yeah, I mean, uh, mixed reality failed uh, yeah. for Microsoft. Uh, HoloLens has failed other than as a very vertical device. Apparently, it's part of the uh, military industrial complex now. Um, in fact, Windows Mixed Reality is coming out of Windows in 24H2, so it's not even going to be there anymore. Wow, that's amazing. Um, wow. Microsoft does support Vision Pro and MetaQuest with its productivity stuff. Right. You know, Microsoft 365 and so forth. But the, it's weird. The When PlayStation did a pretty good job over two generations with VR hardware, I think the the most recent gen got hurt by con. You know, it was expensive. but um, Microsoft never bothered. And I, again, interest. I think it, yeah. well, the, well, hardware margins, we've always lost money on hardware, right? The relative volume of these things is low. They had their big splash with connect, which for 10 seconds was awesome. 
and then became a nightmare. Still, and then they made me. that mistake of uh, bundling it. You know, yeah. I think that kind of thing is. They got a sour taste from it. Yeah, and by the way, for whatever it's worth, I mean, uh, the Connect and the little me people that we had for a little while as our little avatars in Xbox space was obviously based on the Nintendo Wii at the time. And right. they had those little weird controllers, the nunchucks and things you could, right. people were throwing at their screens by mistake. Right. Um, you know, they tried to emulate that. It's worth pointing out, Nintendo walked away from that too, by That's the way, true. right? The 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 Switch That's doesn't true. have anything like that. No. So They didn't make another Wii U, you're right, yeah. I'm not trying to be a jerk to gamers like myself, but uh, we're not exactly active people. It's a weird. I mean, you know, <laughs> yeah, really, you don't really you know? want to get up. It's a weird. <laughs> I have to say, it's a weird category. It's such a niche, yeah. really. Uh, and in a way, Microsoft cannibalizes their own PC market by being a good gaming machine. I mean, yeah, uh, maybe they feel like, well, there's people who aren't going to do PC gaming, and we want to capture them. But really, the people who don't do PC gaming probably don't do console gaming either. They probably do casual gaming yes. and microsoft has no position there well i guess they do now that they own king but um yeah but there's no i there's no at microsoft play anymore there was a brief one with windows mixed reality although i can't i couldn't point to a single first party game that supported that right um they, that was a good example of them throwing something out in the world and seeing what happened and what happened was nothing so you know they they weren't behind it hundred percent because the, there weren't any Microsoft apps of anything other than the basics. Like, look, you can look at a web browser and a 2d, you know, Ooh, panel on the wall, how cool. um, that kind of stuff, or here's your zoom or whatever we had at the time, music collection, like neat, you know, um, I just, I don't know what to say. I don't know. I just don't see it being a, a thing for them. So interesting. Yeah. It's weird that they would come out and say the largest technical leap you've ever seen. And <laughs> that was a like, what is, I, I like I like companies to be bold, you know, but then they fall into caricature, like uh, the courage statement that Apple made. Yeah, about that the was Mac, bad. Mac in, Pro, that was a dumb miscalculation. That was, hindsight, that was dumb. Yeah. Yeah. In in the Windows space, we had Terry Morrison claiming they were going to hit a, a billion Windows 10 users within, I think they said two to three years. And then within 10 seconds, they realized, oh, are we going to scale this back? That's not going to happen. Like, you know, it's. And then you get into a situation where they kind of cook the books for several months to try to make it work, you know? So we'll see what that means. Yeah. I don't know what to say. It's yeah. delightfully vague. <laughs> so I don't know. That could be the show title. Delightfully vague. Delightfully vague. Except I yeah. think we might've used it. I don't know. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> we still have much more to talk about, including windows 11, but let's take a little break here. I'm stalling as uh, Richard Campbell drives up Highway 200 on his way. Mm. Oof, I feel <laughs> weird betting on that. I don't know. Uh, don't speed, Richard. Don't speed. If you're listening to us on the radio, it's okay. It's okay. We'll, we'll, we can do the show without you. We really can. Maybe that's what he's afraid of. I know. <laughs> he shouldn't be afraid. I, I love him. Fear not. Him Fear not, Richard. Your, your seat is safe. Mm -hmm. Our show this week brought to you by Melissa, the data quality experts. Melissa has helped over 10,000 businesses worldwide uh, harness accurate data with their industry-leading solutions. They process, this kind of blows me away, over 1 trillion address, email, name, and phone records. Ask G2, and they'll tell you in the 2024 grid report that Melissa are the leaders in data quality and address verification. They got that prestigious leader title. Melissa offers everything you might want as a, as a user. Free trials, sample codes, flexible pricing with an ROI guarantee. They have unlimited tech support to customers. And by the way, it is international all over the world, all over the world. And if you are in government, you'll be glad to know they're FedRAMP authorized. Actually, that's everybody benefits from that higher security level. They are a FedRAMP authorized data resource, means you get the highest level of security for your customer data. It's also GDPR and CCA, CCPA, the California Privacy Act, uh, compliant. They meet SOC 2 and HIPAA high trust standards for information security management. So you never have to worry about giving your data to Melissa. But you do have to worry that your data is going bad even as we speak, which is why you need Melissa. 
You can also improve your e-commerce operations with Melissa. Now as an ESRI partner, Melissa's cloud-based tools standardize, validate, verify, and enhance data. All that data on which top business operations rely, ensuring address data is seamlessly location optimized. And remember to download the free Melissa Lookups app. You can get it on iOS and Android. Absolutely free. You don't even have to sign up and you can use it to look up addresses, uh, IP addresses, phone numbers. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned free at melissa.com slash twit. M-E-L-I-S-S-A, melissa.com slash twit. We thank him so much for supporting Windows Weekly. It's kind of like the good old days. Me and Paul <laughs> waiting for Richard to come yeah. home up all night, tapping our wristwatches. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Windows 11 <laughs> News. Yes. So Microsoft's new thing is to always release insider builds right after we do Windows Weekly, which <laughs> yeah. I find to be hilarious. <laughs> Excuse me. I try not to um, take it personally. <laughs> it's like, it's kind of hard sometimes. Kind of hard, you know, I try. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> people who've been watching the show for a while or reading the site will remember that there used to be this event that would occur right before every new version of Windows was released that I referred to as the magic window. It was that time when you could switch out of the Insider program and go back right. to stable. Because right. back in the day, each part, each channel uh, or ring, as we used to call them a long time ago, uh, corresponded to some version of Windows. Now it's this you know, mess of who knows what, what's what. And but the weird thing about that to me is that there's UI in Windows. If you go into the Windows update settings, uh, advanced, I think, or whatever it is down there, this is the Windows Insider bit. Um, the UI is still in Windows. It says, you know, click here and you'll get out when this version of Windows is released. The problem is that version of Windows is, is not a version of Windows. It never gets released. And so people sign up and roll into the Insider program and then they can't get out. Um, back in, I think it was January, there was a beta channel build where, uh, Microsoft said, you know, we're going to let you guys get out. We're going to give you an, they didn't call it this, but I think of it as an off ramp. Well, maybe they didn't call it this. Uh, it's an off ramp, right? In other words, they're going to, they, they've started to bring some mobility back to the insider program. They also aligned, remember the dev and, uh, beta channels. Uh, no, I'm sorry, the, the Canarian dev channels, right, which are now heading toward 24H2, right? And so there's a little bit of mobility there. They've never announced this, but I've heard now from three different people in the release preview program who were able to get out of release preview um, by turning off that switch that says always get the quickest, you know, the builds quick as quick as possible, looking for updates, and then they get offered the stable version of Windows 11. So... I think they're, it took them three, four years or something, but I think they're finally starting to move into this uh, type of system. Again, not that there'll be a magic window necessarily, although they've been so obvious about 24H2 so far in advance, which they've not done in three, four, five years, I don't know, a long time, uh, maybe never ever with Windows 11, um, that maybe they're, you know, they understand the problem here and they're actually trying to fix it. I will say if you're in the insider program, you need to be technical enough to know how to, you know, reset the computer back to stable, right? That you should be able to download an ISO, put it on a USB key, clean install. I I I feel like that should be you should be able to prove you have to do that before they let you enroll a computer insider. But since they don't do that, uh, at least they're giving people a way out. So that's neat. Um, that wasn't really a I wrote this. Be I wrote about this, and I'm talking about it now because I've heard from people who have experienced it. Uh, I look back because I re I had a vague memory that they were doing this with at least one channel, and I think it is the beta channel. I wouldn't be surprised to discover they just do this everywhere. And if you think about how an operating system, the uh, applications you run, and the data you own are all kind of segmented, or not kind of, but literally are segmented. Um, th this type of thing. Honestly, shouldn't be a technical challenge for Microsoft. So I'm glad to see him doing it. It's it's kind of a nice thing. I could test Windows 11, whatever channel for, you know, two months to say, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm going back to stable and flip a switch, install the build and just go. I, I think do that all the time. I think that's, yeah, I miss that. Yeah. This is the way Android works. I think it's the way iOS works. You know, if you're on a beta, you no, can say, hey, I, I want to get uh, out of this. Yeah. Is what it, is no? it on iOS? You delete the uh, beta 
profile. I think the and enrollment on, uh, search, yeah, yeah. 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 he is rebooting to kind of, I think, right? Because these back. things are all segmented. Yeah, yeah, yeah I think you're so, right. Yeah, I mean, they, they, I guess um, they're worried that people are unsophisticated enough that they might not know that when you go back to stable, you might lose some features because you're <laughs> testing features that are for a version that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, but but I, should, to me, yeah. that's just obvious. You but, shouldn't okay. be in the insider program. If you... I think the same thing. So, yeah, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. yeah, but who knows? I guess they've made it too easy maybe to enroll. So lots of uh, mainstream users in there. Yeah, I guess. And then, know. yeah. So since last week, I guess since last week's show, we've uh, every channel has gotten new builds, right? And so Canary and Dev, like I said, are, are on the same builds for now. It's they're explicitly testing 24H2. I do like that transparency. Um, there's an interesting feature. Let me see if I have it on this computer, actually. So if you, oh, this looks completely different. Why does this look different on every computer? Yeah. So if you have, if you're unstable, like I am, no, it's kind of, well, I, you think I'd be getting used to this. So if you're unstable now, you can go and look at the widgets board and if the UI looks a little different at the top, they used to have a little picture view up there, but you see a little gear icon instead, you have the option to, let me see what the name of it is, is to, da, da, da. yeah, there's an option there called show or hide feeds. You can turn off that crappy news junk that's in there. Oh, hallelujah. Just turn off Microsoft Start. Yeah, you can turn it off. Um, in the future, I suspect we're going to see some third-party feeds show up, so you could add you know, not that Google would do this, but like a Google News feed or maybe an RSS reader will make a feed or something. But for now, you can just toggle Microsoft Start on or off and you should turn it off. It's junk. And when you do that, the widgets board, become the widgets interface becomes just widgets, <laughs> like as the name suggests. So uh, in my case, I see weather and traffic in this area, which is apparently horrific. Um, some stock. And now we know stuff, why you know, Richard's photo. not here. Yeah. yeah. So, okay. So that's it. Uh, so where do, tell me how to do that again. Yeah. So if you open widgets, widgets, yeah. it depends on what you see there. Right. So it, it, and it's not clear how you get this update per se. I think it was part of a KB that went out recently, but if you open that interface and you see a, if you see a little picture there in the cor corner, you, yeah, you yeah. Have this yet. it's like a person with a talk. Yeah. But if you see a gear in the top, right. Oh, I see the gear. Widgets. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Then you'll have a new menu, a new settings menu. Yeah. Which uh, discover new widgets, personalize. Et yeah, cetera, yeah, et cetera. yeah. 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 Down uh, four or five items is something called show or hide feeds. Uh-huh. Uh, click that and yeah. you'll see an option to Microsoft disable Microsoft start. start. Off. There you go. <gasps> yep. Widgets board yep. needs to close. Good. That's fine. I don't mind. Okay. Yeah. So they tested that feature for, you know, 10 or 12 seconds in Insider. So we have that now. That's good. Oh, I really like uh, this. That's, th that's so this much what better. everyone wanted. Yep. Yeah. But they're, they're, they're continuing to test changes to widgets and in the... I think it's Canary, well, Canary and Dev are the same. So in Canary and Dev, there's actually new navigation. Uh, there's a new navigation pane on the left of the widgets board, for lack of a better term. And I, if I understand the image I'm looking at correctly, you could probably switch between different views where you just have widgets, you just have Microsoft Start, you might just have a third party thing in the future if you know they could ever get anyone to extend it. Um, so they, they continue to kind of work on this user interface. So here we are, what, three years in plus, and uh, they finally are you're fixing the biggest, uh, well, not the biggest, but one of the biggest complaints, certainly, that people have had with Windows 11 and this terrible interface, which should be useful, but is just terrible. So that's good. Um, there's a new accessibility setting for low vision users. They're testing, uh, the, you know, the, the weathered experience on the lock screen that's been unstable since uh, late last year. They're still testing that in Canary and Dev for some reason. And I have no idea what's going on there. Um, and if you do want to do a clean install of this latest build, you can do so. There are downloadable ISOs, um, which they only do every, you know, a couple of months. I, they don't do it for every build. Um, beta channel, nothing major there. Uh, they brought some of the updates to this snipping tool and notepad app, which includes, by the way, that AI copilot, you know, help me write thing to, uh, to beta. That's okay. Um, there's that new manage mobile devices interface where you take a, a picture on your phone and you, if you want it, you can get a notification right there in your PC and download it immediately, I guess for the, I don't know why people need it that immediately, but whatever. I mean, I go back, I go between my phone and my computer all the time. I don't think I've ever once wanted to do that exactly, but they're doing that. That's okay. Um, where Microsoft is being very explicit about 24H2, they're not being explicit about Moment 5 because, of course, they never publicly said that term. So the release preview got 
a humongous update uh, last week. And it's one of those configuration change updates where it flips a bunch of features on that were silently installed on your computer when you weren't paying attention. And this is very clearly moment five, right? And so if Microsoft follows the schedule, I want to be clear, they don't have to and don't. Uh, next Tuesday, the 27th is week D. That would be the week. And if week D comes, we talk next week. We'll see if they do this, but that should be the day that moment five, which won't be called that, right? It will be KB something, 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 will be a preview update, optional install. And then two weeks after that, probably, but again, these things change, who knows, uh, it will go to stable. So release preview has it now. Uh, those people who want to install in stable, the preview update will have it next Tuesday, probably again. And then potentially two weeks from then, it would go out stable to everybody or at least start rolling out. So, uh, I don't know that anything in here sticks out, honestly. Um, one of the alleged features is that Copilot in the taskbar is moving over to the right of right side of the taskbar, except on every one of my computers now, it's already there. So I don't know. I mean, this is one of those, like they, this, they always do this. You know, they this is like a feature of it, but it's out, it's still unstable. They just, they just kind of blur, burp things out now. Um, some improvements to Windows Share, which I think a lot of people don't use. I think the one improvement it could use is a consistent interface that works everywhere, including in OneDrive folders, but that's not how that works. Um, nearby share, uh, is being fixed as well. Transfer speed improvements. I've already seen this feature, so I don't know what's going on there. Um, new snap layout suggestions, where if you snap a window or app to into a particular area, it will look at what else is running and use AI because that's what everything is now to suggest. Maybe this is the layout you want. Hmm. I feel like when people do snap, they know what they want. How well does that work? I mean, yeah. Have you tried it? No, I've not tried it. Yeah. I, I just don't, I honestly <laughs> I don't need I, help with that really. Right. Well, yeah. I, and I did, I, I don't mean to be condescending, but I, I but I am no, <laughs> I, 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 uh, no. Um, it's a weird fact that I probably use snap with one window only more than I use it to snap actual windows. Like I often to want do a, a window full to screen. Snap. You mean, no, I just like, I snap, I'll snap a, for example, um, uh, there are certain apps that I just use almost full screen. Right. So, on this monitor, I'm looking at the way I have, the way I uh, positioned Photoshop was I snapped it to the right half of the screen and then I pull out the side of it so that it fills most of the screen, but I still see some of the desktop. And the reason that I do that is because I use the desktop as a scratch space. Uh, so I like to pull things in, right? right, right. Without having to open a, an Explorer window. Um, and I do that with a lot of windows. It, it, for this show, for example, I have, um, we use uh, Notion for the notes. I have that snapped to the right side of the screen so that when it's zoom, zoom is just floating in a window, but that thing's snapped. It's n nothing is snapped next to it. It's just kind of snapped by itself. I actually just do that a lot. I, I find it nice to just have something stuck to the side. I don't yeah, know. I have, <laughs> I never did this before, but now that you mentioned it, I just snapped the yeah. ad copy to the left and yeah, why not? notes to just the right. It up there as a, yeah, yeah, it's kind of nice. nice. And, yep, that, you know, because I was on one workspace with several windows, it did show me all the windows on the workspace that I could snap to the left. Yeah. That's, that's right. all I really need. I don't need yep. AI no, to tell sure. me. People love their little layouts and things, and you can do that. You can have snap groups and all that, but I don't I don't need help snapping. I would, I don't know what to say. <laughs> it's not complicated. I can do this on an iPad. Um, anyway, it's, it's okay. It's not a bad thing. Um, there's really not a lot here. There are a lot of a lot of little features. There's no big feature, but it's coming. And that's what that's what a moment is really, right? It's a we get uh, individual features almost every month, and then a moment is a collect several or a dozen new features all coming at the same time. So, and that's what this is. Yeah. It's not dramatic. It's just Nothing special. Just yeah. The Keep usual. us on our toes. It's cool. By the way, I just want to thank you for breaking my widgets because now. When I open the widgets, is, I just get yeah. a blank. Blank set. Yeah. No, it's working exactly as you would expect. Um, <laughs> and I, and say, I no longer have the the gear yep. that I can fix it. So that's okay. <laughs> I mean, it's better than having Microsoft News in there. So 
<laughs> and you still have the weather. Here. Nothing is better than Microsoft News. <laughs> Isn't that weird? We're going to agree to that. I probably just that did a weird. restart. It's just a, I know it's just a restart. One weirdism of the, so I, uh, I keep the widgets button in the taskbar because I like the weather. Yeah, me too. I, I, t- I turn off the ability to mouse over it because I don't want it appearing by mistake. But that said, uh, with rare exception, when I, a computer reboots or comes up again, that thing is over there with a null icon and I, I want to see the weather. Right. So I will click on it. It will display widgets very quickly. And it looks exactly like what you just showed with nothing in it. And then I close it and then the weather pops up. Oh, and interesting. I've, I've sat here sometimes for 15, 20 minutes waiting for the little picture of the sun to appear. And it never does. But if I click it, it always appears. Well, so. I'm restarting. We'll see. We'll see if it fixes. So it's a hard computer science problem, I guess. <laughs> turn it off and on. Have you turned yeah. it off and on? <laughs> yeah. It always yeah. works. <laughs> just turn it off. I think that's the answer to this one. A okay. um, couple of other things. So there was <laughs> there was this big report a couple of weeks ago about how Edge was silently siphoning browser data from other browsers. And, uh, oh, and yeah. I saw that and I thought that's interesting because this is a feature of Edge and I don't understand what anyone's complaining about. And I, you know what? I, I should have known better because A, it's Microsoft. B, it's Edge. You know, C, nothing works the way it's supposed to anyway. So there's, there's an inconsistency occurring here where when you run the out-of-box experience, which is that kind of white and blue part of Windows setup that you see when you bring up a new computer or a recently reset computer, it runs through different stages of a wizard, right? And some of them always have to appear, and some of them are optional. Some of them depend on whether you're paying for uh, a Game Pass subscription or a Microsoft 365 subscription. They'll try to upsell you on those things if you're not. But one, one of the ones that's inconsistent and makes my life miserable because I'm trying to document exactly what happens is it it will sometimes pop up this window that says, hey, would you like to bring in your browsing data? And it's the type of thing that sounds kind of innocuous. Um, if you are a Microsoft Edge user and you're using Microsoft Windows on with Microsoft Edge on a new computer and you think what this means is the data that's synced to your Microsoft account, of course the answer is yes, you want that. You know That's what everyone does with browsers. But they've changed it. You actually have to read it really carefully and maybe even click on the link that goes to the web because actually what that thing enables is the site, literally every single time you launch the browser, Microsoft Edge will look at all of your browser data in Chrome and import it again, just in case you've made any changes. Um, It's really aggressive. It's totally unnecessary. I don't quite understand what they were even thinking with this because most people... Obviously, a lot of people use multiple browsers. I do, but I don't know that you want them that synced up every single second. And I also feel like a lot. The point of this kind of functionality is that it it happens once and you're done. You can import it, right? Um, there is an interface buried deep in Microsoft Edge. I, I've added it to the. Oh, no, it's not public yet, but I'm adding it to the book. I'm not going to bother documenting it here as we talk, but you, you can actually turn this on and off in the browser. And I think that the the glitch, such as it was, was that. In cases where people ignored this option or said no to it and then later installed Chrome and or, because it's Microsoft, who knows, um, you already had both those browsers on your system, it somehow got enabled by default. But this has been a feature of Microsoft Edge for a long time. It's not a new thing. It's it behaving like a, an errant AI or like Dave or the, uh, sorry, like a Hal in uh, 2001 Space Odyssey is, is new, I guess. But, you know, it's Microsoft Edge. How do you think it's going to behave? It's terrible. Anyway, it's fixed. Okay, <laughs> I, I don't know. You get what you you get what you uh, you get what you deserve, I guess. Uh, if you use Edge, I think wasn't so, it Brad that was complaining about all the that kept importing his Chrome stuff? I think it was Brad. No, it was uh, Tom Warren. Tom Warren. Yeah. Okay, okay. And then you know, my reaction to that is like, what are you doing using Edge? I, I you know, <laughs> what do you think was going to happen? Did you, you think it was going to behave better all of a sudden, or did you think it was just going to always be crappy? Like, what were you uh, thinking? Um. <laughs> Oh, well. Okay. So start, uh, speaking of Brad, though, our buddies at Stardock um, announced something called the Object Desktop Insider Program, right? So uh, they took the worst part of Microsoft and said, look, we should do that. <laughs> no, that's, um, and that's cool. That's fine. So if you're an Object Desktop owner, you can get into the, they call it a feature. You get into this program and it allows you to get access to pre-release versions of new apps and also features ahead of the public release. Um, this kind of limits the audience a bit, right? But the interesting thing about this is they're going ARM. So 
uh, you if you are in this program, if you own Object Desktop you and have an ARM-based PC, you can actually download the first pre-release versions of native ARM versions of Start 11, Fences, and Groupie. And uh, we'll see if there are more in the future. We'll see where this goes. But uh, they're actually kind of making a big bet here that ARM is going to become a thing on Windows. So I'd love them. I guess we'll see. But um, there's no way you can do this otherwise. You have to be part of Object Desktop to to I'll see have, this. But I'll eventually, have to try it. Uh, you know, because yeah, I am using it on my Mac. Mac. That's what I use on my Mac. Yes, yeah. is, is uh, ARM version. Yeah, I don't have an ARM PC here, so I didn't even right. Uh, right. I didn't even try, but. Yeah, I spent half an hour today installing Windows. I have seven computers here, and none oh, of them are God. running Windows 11 Home. I know, and I was like, ah, uh, oh so I'm like, I'll try God. it. I'll try it in the VM then, I guess. So oh. I spent half an hour on that, and then the thing I was trying it was about device encryption, and device encryption doesn't work in a VM because the TPM that Hyper V supports doesn't it doesn't work anyway. Right. That's my life. Uh, and then Google, um, I don't know what prompted this exactly, but last week I think. Uh, I came up with an announcement. This was aimed at Chrome OS enterprise customers. Uh, people might use Chrome books in the enterprise, but actually it applies to anybody, which is that um, there are, depending on who you talk to, there could be hundreds of millions of computers that are exiting support with Windows 10 next year. And uh, as <laughs> we talked about that kind of uh, hyperbolic, 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 hyperbolic statement that Hyperbolic. Hundreds of millions of these computers are going to end up in the landfill. And I'm like, Hundreds well, they're going to end up in the landfill eventually. But yeah. if you want to prevent it, uh, Google has a solution. It's kind of interesting. You can use uh, their Chrome OS Flex, right? Which is that yeah. open version that works on any computer. And, um, you know, a bunch of people try it. It's free, by the way. You can, you can evaluate I'm this for that, free right I'm now. I'm glad if you that they're continuing to work on this. When it, it was a company called Neverware that they That's acquired, right. and it worked yep. kind of on, you know, maybe a third of the PCs yeah. I had lying around. This is so old. It used to be for Intel Macs too. Like it's yeah, a, right. If you have an Intel Mac, you can, right. you can work there but too. It sounds like Google's kind of, now they bought it. Yeah. They've made it, it a and, formal part of the, yeah, yeah. it's good. Um, it's a good yeah, use it's, for it's an old good. PC. I mean, if you, if you don't go to run windows you, 95, a couple of caveats here. So they, they do have a hardware compatibility list. Yes. Yeah, if your perfect. computer's on that list, you're going to have a good experience. Right. And that's great. If it's not, it's still worth trying. By the way, it's a lot like a Linux distribution where you kind it of is blow a thing onto a. It actually is. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird how similar it is, Leo. I don't yeah. know if you know this. But <laughs> oddly, very similar. oddly similar. Uh, <laughs> meaning when you, when you put it onto a USB key, uh, you can boot the computer that way. You don't have to install it. You can just run it right off the USB key to kind of evaluate it. So you can get a good idea of how well it's going to work before ah, you good idea. install it. So that's that's nice. Yeah. Um, compared to Chrome OS, a couple of differences. You don't get Android apps. Um, I think, I'm not sure about this one. I, I believe you do get the Linux part of it. I hope I'm not wrong about that. Um, and then the support timeline is kind of an open question. And that's kind of the problem. Even if you read that uh, Chrome OS Enterprise blog post, they're really vague about it. Um, they will support it on, well, at least in Chrome OS Enterprise, past the Windows XP timeline. It may vary by PC. It's not clear. I don't know that there's a way you can go into the UI and see, you know, what the date is, you know, how far it's going to go. But um, it's possible it might, you know, they'll, they'll exit support someday, right? We just don't know what that day is. So for individuals, that might be a little more dicey. But, you know, again, if you have an older computer, it doesn't matter if Windows whatever is supported or not. It's... Uh, and you want to try something a little different. I mean, you could think of this thing as a light version of Linux. You know, it's all web apps. You don't get the Android stuff, but I don't know. I honestly, I think Android apps on Chrome OS are kind of a neat thing in some ways, right? Especially if they've been tailored for big screens and all that. But I, I don't use too many of them. It's not I a huge think, loss. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think so. And, and think. honestly, if you wanted Linux, just put Linux on there. So even if it doesn't, yeah, and, and Steeny, I don't think that's a big deal either. I. Yeah, I mean Linux has gotten a lot better in recent oh, years, and they're totally really user friendly yeah, distributions. Absolutely, you know, yeah, you know, uh, Mint and Ubuntu, obviously, but I, I like Elementary OS a lot. I like Zorin OS a lot. Uh, kind of, if you like something or want something that looks a little bit like Windows or whatever, and or even the Mac, you know, that's kind of friendly. It's a bunch of stuff out there. Yeah, Elementary is kind of like the Mac. Yeah, there's a new Pop OS coming. They've rewritten the yeah. uh, desktop environment. That's a very compatible and easy. And that's the one they put on, on those system system seventy six. System yeah. seventy six. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they yeah they are a hardware manufacturer, but they are doing a pretty good distro uh, as well. Yeah, yeah. I'll probably look at that one soon too. Yeah, actually. I like Pop OS. Yeah, I've had good re I've had good success with 
Linux. Uh, it's gotten more and more. Compatible. I don't want to overinflate the the stats here, but across a number of PCs, yeah, I'll say. it's much more compatible than it used to be. Yeah, yeah. The definitely. only thing often is to... you have to turn off secure boot. Um, oh. I don't know right. if you've noticed that or not, but um, it seems like I, I always have to do that. I haven't had a problem with maybe that. They've actually, so that. You know. Maybe they've gotten around yeah. that. Then. Okay. Yeah. Even better. Yeah. I have weirder problems like uh, Zorin. <laughs> we or, all no, know well, that, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah. It's not worth just going into it. It's a graphics thing. It's, it's, if you have an NVIDIA graphics card, there's some. Oh, yeah. But it, actually, no. yeah. AMD works best, but I use my, I yeah. run Linux on an NVIDIA machine uh, and it works fine. Yeah. That's my gaming machine because I can run the Steam on it. And thanks to Steam mm -hmm. Deck, a lot of those games now work on Linux. Yeah. And that was a, that question came up before the Microsoft event. But what about Game Pass on Steam Deck, uh, which would mean Ooh. Game Pass on Linux, which I mean, that gets Ooh. really interesting. Ooh. I'd be very right? interested in that. Yeah. I, all the work, and uh, this is years old now, but two, two ish years ago, uh, Gabe Newell from uh, Valve said, yeah, we would work with Microsoft on this. Of you course know? he would. And, sure. uh, and Phil Spencer at the time said, yeah, this sounds, this is really interesting. And then, you know, nothing ever happened. So I, I could picture that being part of that Xbox everywhere kind of deal. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That'd be, that's pretty neat. Or as we say here in Mexico City, pretty bueno. Pretty, they say that really? <laughs> pretty bueno. I'm, I'm trying to make it a thing. That's my thing. I, <laughs> all my thing. all my friends here. Pretty, are, pretty bueno. I, I walked with this, a, a, a week ago, I walked into our sushi. I asked the woman there how she was doing. She goes, pretty bueno. And I'm like, oh, nice. you're spreading it. By the way, okay, two <laughs> things happening. I got to observe. I'm following your Instagram. That yeah. sushi class was wild with the full oh, God. giant Amazing. tuna. Holy yep. cow. I bet that yep. was good sushi, too. And oh the other God. thing is, obviously, uh, Mex Mexico City is agreeing with you. You've lost weight. You look great. You, lo you I lost a lot of weight. weight. When I come here. Yeah, yeah, I think it's the diarrhea. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I think it's the... Uh, no, I'm like, um, No, I think that there's something about travel when you kind of change your diet. Uh, there's you know, something your you're body, doing. It, it must be mad to, dogs or something, but there's something you're doing well, no, so, in Makanji so, that you're not doing in Mexico City. I've told this story before. I'm sure I apologize if I'm repeating, but I I always order things without bread or potato or whatever. Yeah, and yeah. this causes no no end of amusement and confusion. But if you ever want to know that you've said something correctly, for me, it's, you know, hamburguesa con queso, sin papa, sin pan. And they, they're writing and they go, what? <laughs> really? Seen, seen pun? Seen pun? And then they laugh. And you're like, I said it right. <laughs> you crazy. Uh, I am the only person gringo? in this country that orders food without bread. Yeah. Hey, there's no doubt no, about it. That's good for you. Good. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah you look anyway. fantastic. Well, I know. Well, I noticed yeah. at first in your Insta, I thought, whoa, is that an old photo? Because you, you, when you did your whole <laughs> keto phase, uh, you, yeah. your paleo phase, you looked great. You gained a little weight yeah. back, I know. But uh, yeah, it was temporary. I mean, it was just. It's great. You, you know. look fantastic. Anyway. I'm just going to stick with it this time. Good. You know, you're going you to. I need to do that too. I got to do that too. It's hard, but yeah. you just got to just work. Just, just get through but it. you're still eating, uh, are you eat beans? You eat beans. How can you, oh, yeah. How beans can you are, I have to. Beans. Digestively. Beans so you are eat carbs. You just don't eat processed carbs, bread. Yeah. So. I have a lot of salad. I eat a lot of salad. Yeah, salad. And actually here, it was a key finding. There are three places in the neighborhood that make fantastic salad. It's like really, really good salad. Oh. Probably you would. Which, again, you wouldn't think in Mexico. Oh, a well, thing, you might. Uh, although you could listen, you could you can buy candy from a child on the street. It's and I'm talking like a gigantic cart of just multicolor candy. <laughs> That's what junk. I look like for a, in a city. It's, it's crazy. <laughs> I could solve the obesity problem here today. Just stop drinking Coke and get rid of the candy. I agree. And when you're done with that, let's start on the bread because there's way too much. Oh, candy. yeah, the bread. Now you eat tortillas, corn tortillas. No, no, no. So none of that stuff. Nope. And no looks. potatoes. That's all I'm saying. And laughs. How it's about rice? Do you eat rice? No. 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 But beans are okay. Yeah, I want like to follow we, your we diet. The, That's why I'm asking. Yeah. The, yeah, the, car, the uh, caldo place, which is like chicken soup, um, it usually comes with rice. I got, I know, you know, uh, Cena Rose, as we say here. And then uh, the, it does come with like, gar is garbanzo beans? I mean, no, chickpeas. Chickpeas, chickpeas are garbanzo beans. And chickpeas beans, thing, probably yeah. has, oh, they're the same thing. Yeah. It probably has, this price some carbs to that, but you know, yeah, I, it's I like, like beans. that's a whole food. It's, like it's, it's a whole food. It's like beans. Yeah, it's all good. Yeah. All that's right. my theory. Well, I'm sticking with it. <laughs> there's your, uh, <laughs> there's your, your uh, Paul Theron uh, health tip for the week. <laughs> yeah. When I, 
screen careen over from a heart attack tomorrow you can just go the other direction <laughs> we're gonna take a little break uh richard campbell is i hope gonna get here he's is he put a brown like yeah, we have i've not heard a thing from him so I, that tells me he might still be in he's on air. roots no brown pick no brown liquor pick yet maybe yeah, get looking. stephanie to give us a nice mexican cocktail oh yeah we could do that we got build news microsoft 365 news we're going to talk ai and just in case you didn't get enough xbox that's coming up too as windows weekly continues with the solo paul therott build is to, coming to sorry to, to quick update sorry quick update I, uh, richard did in fact text me i missed it this is about half an hour ago still in the air oh he's in the air but this is yeah well then i don't know where he is in relation to that. <laughs> you know? do you have a flight number i can track it i do <laughs> i do not okay um from now on we yeah. gotta get rich's flight uh number so we could just put it on the screen as he's slowly approaching. yes that would be amazing <laughs> calculate how much time <laughs> it would take for him you know if everything goes right in customs he's going to which, pv i presume that's vacation for him He's not doing another yes. conference. Now, my only question is whether he goes home first and goes from there. I, uh, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. I don't remember. I, don't I should remember this, but I don't remember. And then uh, you're going to go home pretty soon or go back to. No, I'm still here. We're here through the 12th. Okay. So we still have almost. That's almost right. We overlap by one day. Yeah. March 11th, we're going to Cabo. So I'll wave yeah, as we right. fly by. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, you don't fly through Mexico City, though, right? You go to no, right no, it's a straight flight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, if you did go to Mexico City, we'd see your plane. The flight path is right in front of our apartment. We is it really? <laughs> planes all night. Oh, yeah. All night long. Mm. Last night, we saw a plane from uh, Peru that was going up somewhere in North America, not oh, to Mexico. Cool. And planes from the United States coming the other day. Yeah, it was You know, sometimes amazing. when people get old, they sit on the porch, they look at birds. You're just going <laughs> to sit on your balcony and look at planes. It's great. Well, we get to watch the drivers trying to parallel park. That's always hilarious <laughs> below us. And then, I mean, they don't. I don't think they ever taught it in school. I have these... <laughs> It's, it's hilarious. I mean, it's just like they parallel. They do like a 21 point turn. It's like you're still three feet away from the street. You know, the curb. What are you doing? Like, I, I don't know what's happening with those guys. But yes, yeah, so we get that below us. We get the planes in front Very of us. Very entertaining. So you get stars above us. It's, it's pretty. Very entertaining. Yeah. Uh, let, us, uh, <laughs> let us continue with uh, <laughs> Build. You're going to have to come up to Seattle in May. I will see. So I... It heard this as a rumor, you know, or from a source that this was happening. So that Microsoft is now confirmed that Build 2024 will be in Seattle on May 21st through the 23rd. The question is whether this is kind of a reduced event like they did with Ignite over the past couple of years and Build over the past couple of years. Um, there's been no word if they're going to invite the press or not. Um, I'll talk to Richard and see if I can sneak in on the uh, the podcaster thing again. But I can tell you, I made many people very upset by doing that um, because they felt like they, sh if the rot was there, why can't we be there kind of thing? Um, because you're not a podcast, you jerk. No, I don't know. Um, so we'll see. I hope to go. I will, I will go if I can. Uh, absolutely. And that's all we know. That's the, the whole thing. Well, we know it's going to be a big focus on AI and co-pilot, right? It's not going to be. Build is always a bunch fun of though, stuff. right? Build is one of the Build more, is my I favorite think. Microsoft yeah, show me too. by far. Yep. Yeah. Yep. I because we both like to code and stuff. And I just, I always find yep. that fascinating. Love it. Steve, was that the Stevie Batish uh, talk? Was that Bill? Yes, it was. Okay. And I, I, it is amazing how quickly that has risen in the ranks of like greatest Microsoft speeches yeah. of all time. It is. I, I, and every time there's an AI announcement related to Microsoft, I can point to Stevie Batish and see, he said this, this is what he told us was going to happen. He gave us a great you know? roadmap. I mean, the, oh, the so clearest good. So well-spoken. Yep. And it was funny because it was kind of presented as I'm kind of on the way to the airport and I only have a few minutes. So let me just rattle through this real quick. And then he delivered the most concise, clear headed, uh, transparent speech about what Microsoft was doing with AI that I've ever seen in my life. Um, you know, compare and contrast this to such uh, talks in my past as the introduction of Windows Azure, as it was called at the time, or the the big Microsoft quantum computing introduction where i walked out in the most confused befuddled state of my entire life in both cases I had no idea what they were talking about um ai should be confusing it's complicated and he made it make sense you know god bless the guy that's a, it was very clear and it, it was also a gift. really good to hear what microsoft is planning you know what they how what their thinking was yes exactly exactly and and 
my God, you know, again, not to keep, I'm not I'm going to try not to keep mentioning this, but one of the things that comes up as a recurring theme in that Sanofsky book is this notion that Microsoft, uh, rather Windows did not have a coherent app strategy since before Longhorn, <laughs> you know, that made any sense that uh, they just never, they just throw out a bunch of stuff and it never went anywhere. And this is the opposite of that. Um, I th and again, very high level. It's not like something a developer could say, okay, this tells me the frameworks and languages and things I need to use. It's not that, but, um, but just, yeah, exactly how Microsoft sees, right. And how Microsoft is making their own apps. You know, he cites uh, apps like designer and ClipChamp, which are in the Microsoft right, stable right. and then how things like legacy apps, like those apps in office, uh, like how those things will, uh, be co-pilot designs, whether you work, you know, work side by side. Um, I just thought it was. Yeah, I can't will, talk enough uh, about that. Will he make a repeat of performance, you think, at Bill? I don't know, but given the little, not a shakeup, but given that the that org has changed a bit and he is now, you know, remember he used to be, he was in Surface and was uh, in, was the guy who, you know, like Rolf uh, used to do a lot of the kind of top level designs, but he would work on the, a lot of the mechanical things like the hinges and so forth. And uh, he's actually now in software, so... Yeah, I, I I would hope so. And in the sense that everyone at Microsoft is probably now or hopefully already has shifted things a little bit career-wise to make sure they're in some sort of AI part of the company. Um, he clearly did that. So yeah, I think he's, I don't know that for a fact. They have not announced speakers or anything, but I, I bet he's going to be a part of it. Hmm. I hope so. I hope so too. I want to just congratulate him when I see him next time yeah. <laughs> on, the, yeah. on his ability to be clear. It's a gift. Yeah. You know, it's nice. Stephen Batish, he mm -hmm. is, uh, what is his job? It says applied sciences here on the. Yeah. The so there you go. That, I mean, that's, that wasn't his title to a year and a half ago. Um, applied sciences. Yeah. He's working his way, right. If he isn't already into that Microsoft fellow. It's like a fellow just, thing. Yeah, yeah. 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 He just, he, he, he skirts into the room like six inches above the ground and <laughs> he speaks and we all just kind of bask in the glory. Well, just look, just, just look at his picture on the, uh, on the page, he looks like uh, yeah, a like crazy, crazy man. Person. Yeah, yeah, it's great. yeah, but he's not. He he's leads not. Microsoft's Applied Sciences Group, an interdisciplinary team of scientists, AI researchers, and product engineers in the Windows and Devices organization. There you go. And by there the way, they go. put AI, they put A period I period. Uh, do, can we just? I'm, I'm sure that? there's a pedantic date debate within Microsoft yeah, about the correct like, spelling. This like, is like, um, oh yeah, we got to do U, it that way. Yeah. U.S. for the United States is always written as U period S period, and right. U.K. never it's, is. Yeah, <laughs> and, and why? I don't know. And by the way, don't tell me. I don't care. Uh, I think <laughs> we've sure all agreed AI is just AI, not a dot I. I think so. Yeah, it's but, become a term. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Microsoft. Had. Steve holds more than 120 patents. He's a fellow for the Society for mm -hmm. Information Display, SID, and has been yeah. honored as an innovator by the IEEE. He's a frequent speaker at international conferences. He's been inventing, yep. shipping new Microsoft devices and, and experiences since 1999 from conceptualizing the original Surface Table. Oh, that thing was yes. his in 2001. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, wow. Well, remember... You know, there was like this multi-touch effort at Microsoft that kind of predated, right. kind of literally predated Windows 8, right? So Windows 7 had multi-touch, but they never really did anything with it. They did that D3, D5, whatever year that was uh, demo. And then, you know, the Microsoft Surface table was part of that era of whatever. And then with Windows 8, they brought the Surface brand into, um, you know, essentially the Windows group, become Surface, right? Uh, the the PC line, right? And and those table, big screen, blah, 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 that became like perceptive pixel or something, or they, they kind of swapped brands, basically. But yeah, I guess there wasn't a big market for uh, Pac-Man games in um, <laughs> casinos. Who knew? You know, tabletop games? I, I saw one in a yeah casino hotel once, and I saw yeah. one on a cruise ship once. Yeah, those are the types of places where you would yeah. see such a thing, right? Yeah. yeah. Resorts. It was a neat demo. I mean, we'd interact with uh, physical objects, you know, in unique ways, which I thought was kind of cool, but it was just hard. You know, it was, one, it was just like HoloLens, like, okay, this is really cool. What do we do with it? You know, and I don't think they ever landed on anything. I also think there was a reason it came out 
right after the iPad, <laughs> which was Apple saying, well, I mean, Microsoft yeah. saying, yeah, we got multi-touch. We've been doing, we, we have, we have, we've had this forever, except it wasn't an uh, iPad. The, it was a little larger. <laughs> there was a lot of backpedaling. You said, it's like, did you say tablet or table? You said table. I thought you said table. Um, that's weird. So it's not the size something I could carry around. Uh, it's something I would sit at. You know, it's a slightly different product. Yeah. Oh, well. Oh, well. Oh, well. All right. What else? Let's see. Uh, Microsoft yeah, 365. Well. Fiverr. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, it, it is uniquely weird to me that Microsoft developed Microsoft Teams sought to integrate it into Windows 11, but used a separate Teams app that was only for consumers, never made the flagship Teams app uh, capable of just being one app that worked with everything, released a major new version last year, right? Which everyone loves basically because it fixes all the problems, except for this one. It's You still need a, a, a different app on the client for consumers. Windows 11 23H2 includes the second major version of that. They got rid of that. Uh, I don't even remember what it was called. That's crazy. That per, whatever that purple icon thing was on the desktop or the taskbar <laughs> rather. Uh, that was in the first couple of versions. Um, major rev of that product. Nobody uses it, right? Why would they? And um, meanwhile, over on mobile, Microsoft Teams always has had one app that works with both types of accounts. So without any ado, there's never been an announcement, but Microsoft quietly about a week ago added to the Microsoft 365 roadmap that they're going to unify the clients. It's going to be one on both Windows and Mac. Um, it's going to happen pretty quick too. It's it's supposed to start rolling out in stable in April. So this is something I guess they've been working on. Um, I don't know what took so long or whatever, but they're, they're doing it. So that's good. Um, the normal reaction to the sentence Microsoft is killing Microsoft <laughs> Publisher is they still make they Microsoft still make Publisher. That. And not only and that, I, they're not killing it now. I know, in they're, two years. They're killing it in two years. Like, what? I got to tell you, I, I've, I've said this, I've said some version of this a bunch of times, especially recently, probably. I, I'm getting a little tired of what I think of as faux outrage. And, I, you know, when Sonos started uh, obsoleting older speakers, everyone who was freaking out was not a Sonos fan, like a user. They were just other people, right? Or when, uh, you know, Apple and the DMA, or you pick your little tech controversy, it's always like people, are, they don't even have any stake in it, right? We'll talk a little bit about Firefox late, later. Um, you know, the people who think that uh, they should be able to, you know, that it's important that they have their own rendering engine. Don't even use Firefox. Like I don't like what you, what what is your what's your angle here? You know, now I'm not saying there aren't people that use Publisher, but I had to look this up. Now I knew Publisher was still in Microsoft 365 because I see it, right? I install it or it's on PCs. Like I know it's there. I couldn't tell you the last time they updated this app. I was surprised to discover that this thing has been around since 1991. It's actually one of the oldest apps. In uh, my, well, what's now Microsoft 365? It's one of the oldest uh, Microsoft Office apps, right? When this thing came out, the competition was Aldous PageMaker and Quark Express, right? It went in InDesign didn't even exist, and back then, of course, a lot of the things we were using computers for would output on paper, right? Whether it was a document or uh, even like a slide deck, you would print the thing out. Like printing that thing out was like a big part of the experience. Like paper really mattered. And I, look, I, I'm not a user, but I, the things I remember about this product is that when Microsoft had their internet explosion thing in the 90s, when they did, you know, turned on a dime and everything was going to be internet, they went through a couple of different phases where maybe this app would be the thing that consumers will use to create web pages, right? Uh, Microsoft Word was one of those. Um, and so too was uh, Microsoft Publisher. I mean, think about it. you're publishing this thing that has kind of layouts and everything. Maybe this could be published into a web page. And I'm sure they, for some years, they probably had that in there. Um, obviously, front page kind of became that thing. And they did online versions of it, like Microsoft Spaces, or I guess it was Windows Live Spaces, probably, whatever that was called, MSN Spaces back in the day. Yada, yada, yada. It doesn't matter. The last major update to this product is, I think, 15-ish years ago. They haven't, you know, people who do, do use it will it will tell you that. It, they haven't done a lot with it. 
And of course, the people who do use it are upset that this thing is going away. Um, but it is going to be in two years and you have a chance to kind of figure out, um, you know, what you might want to move to. I will just say that from a publishing perspective, uh, this kind of publishing, you know, the world has changed, right? We're not, I'm sure some people are still making pamphlets and brochures and things like that, but <laughs> no, I'm sure they are. I'm not trying I'm to. I'm using you know, page maker. Is that going to go yeah. away? <laughs> I'm using a, I, I'm using a product made by Koala <laughs> or, um, <laughs> or uh, with that, what was that thing? The oh, print you would print, print the uh, Bo Broder Brun print Broder print Broder Bund Print Shop print, Pro Print Shop right Print, print Shop, shop yeah. Pro Yeah, uh, like a, you know, brr, 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 on the dot matrix printer you can Bro make like Broder a banner and yeah. happy birthday. Happy birthday! I'm sure there's Paul. still a need for that. I'm not I'm not downplaying <laughs> it. I will say I did walk through an office max the other day here in Mexico City, and they have giant large format printers for people oh, who nice. want to print things. So you don't have to own these things. But oh, nice. anyway. Uh, I think uh, these days, a lot of this stuff is happening online and there are solutions like Canva would be the big one that people think of. I think where you're, you're the, the thing you're targeting is probably social media, right? You might want something that is formatted for a phone or whatever. Um, you know, publishers, obviously not the right thing. For, and by the way, Microsoft has their own thing called designer that targets that stuff too. If you want to stick in the Microsoft sphere, um, you know, there you go. But you have two years to figure it out. It's not like it's an emergency. Um, although if you're using publisher, you're probably not moving very quick, I guess. I don't know. It, it's uh, it's it's weird to me how upset people were about this. Um, we'll see how it looks as we get a little closer. I don't know. Oh. Publisher. Bar I would like to have two years notice before I. Yeah, kick, for everything. Kick, yeah, for, yep. before I kick the bucket. Yeah, like Leo's yeah, you got a you got two a, years. You might as well. Uh, you got a pancreatic thing happening, Leo. But you got a good two years to go. You'll be fine. <laughs> oh God, don't know. Actually, I take it back. I don't <laughs> want like, to. You don't want to know that. I don't want to know Wait, what's that. Happening? Oh, you're right. God, that's why did awful. you tell me that? What do you? <laughs> why did you tell me that? There's nothing I can do. Right? Okay, great. Hmm. Hey, can I move to Canva? I mean, nothing. I don't know about you, but I'm going to have some of this peaty and salty single malt whiskey. <laughs> peaty and salty. That I is know. the wrong combination. It doesn't of seem. Well, it's they're both savory, peaty and salty. It's Japanese. Okay, is it like a barbecue in a bottle? What are we talking about here? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what yeah. is that? Like peaty and salty? Mm -hmm. Yeah, delicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, there's your uh, there's your exciting, thrilling, gripping Microsoft 365 issue. I think we should talk about uh, AI. We haven't talked about AI in a few minutes. Okay. Yes. Uh, we'll start Actually, it with the Microsoft I am, leaning. I got to tell you, I am all in on AI. I love yeah. AI. I was completely a skeptic. And now I was too. I'm a fan only because of how I, I use can't, it. I know. I can't believe how fast it's happening. I'm paying for two AI things now, like a jerk. Me, oh, uh, me we'll too. get to that. No, I'm paying yeah, for right? I'm paying for open we'll AI, see. 20 bucks. I, I think it's going to settle in, but maybe it isn't because I pay for like eight different online uh, Music video services. services. I mean, yep, 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 me too. Difference. Perplexity Maybe this AI. is just the new subscription. I love that there are still skeptics out there. I had a guy in the past week tell me in comments that this was just a scam <laughs> pererpetrated by Microsoft. That's what but I thought. I think you might want to look at it again. I don't think that's the, <laughs> the takeaway. Kind of what I thought initially, but then a I scam. Started, what it is is generally I like where you just kind of say, "Hey, you know, tell me a story." That's dopey. But if you yeah. give it a corpus of information, if you make it an ex, it's mm -hmm. a really good expert system. My this is my end game. I need this is how I might this might result in me finally writing a book, which is just taking all the stuff from the past and and giving me a way to actually make sense of it. Because right now, yeah. I have to dive into all these old folders and try exactly. to figure stuff out. And it's a nightmare. If you could dump um, so, all your notes from whatever oh, one note to see or what this looks like. Notion or what, Notion will do it actually now. Notion has it. Yeah, I think that's a really uh, useful tool. Now the new so. thing is they're training AI, multiple AIs. Google's thing is, well, if we thought, uh, uh, you know, AlphaGo played chess well, but what we're doing is we're taking Deep Blue and AlphaGo yes. and all of these, and we're going to have them teach each other. There's, there's probably a better way to say this, but it, it is these... Uh, I don't know, specialized use cases, uh, for lack of a better term, where, the, where they make this giant thing that's the internet, and it, it it's amazing, but inaccurate, you know, hallucinations, right. whatever. And then you kind of bring it down, you bring it down, and you work with a, a finite set of data that's very specific to a, some topic, you know, maybe. And I think I think this is where, I mean, I think all of it's amazing, but I, there, there are going to be some, like, for example, 
Um, they have already, since the dawn of the AI age 17 seconds ago, um, <laughs> translated these scrolls from languages. Oh, no wasn't that amazing? Anymore. Was I mean, it's I, they have scrolls is, from Pompeii yes. that were ash. Basically, you couldn't unscroll them because right. they would fall so, apart. But they're yeah. using X-rays and AI, and they're able to they're starting yes. to able to able to read them. This is oh god, this stuff is amazing. This really is interesting this stuff. I love this. Yeah. So, and we'll get into this a little bit because you know Google as Google brings their AI down from massive cloud ultra whatever to Gemma to now you have it in workspace and as an individual in Google One. Um, you know, they're starting to talk and they're starting to go the enthusiast route. Like here's some offline, nan they don't call it nano, but some offline whatevers that you, uh, LLMs that you can use yeah. against NVIDIA chipsets on your yep. own laptop. And NVIDIA has released one. I use, I've tried it. Olama Honey. is one. And what your wife, is she bringing you a drink? And she's talking can... on the phone, like two feet away from me. Hey, and I, then I said so, to him, I says, I says, pretty, pretty bueno. I pretty says. bueno. That's pretty no bueno over there. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've tried Olama and there's one called GPT for all and download them to my yes. Mac. Uh, and then you download a model. It has to be, you know, it doesn't have to be, it should be an open source model like Llama, Llama 2. And then you can try stuff, but I still haven't figured out. And I think there's a Python script to do this, how to get my PDFs into it. Cause if I can just yeah. do that, I, then I won't have to, you know, and I think yes. they would want so, that because it saves them money too, right? It's using my electricity, not theirs. That's right, of course. You, the more this stuff works locally, right? I mean, this is Private. It's genius. And yeah, yeah, yeah it, right. It, it kind of hits on all those levels. I but it you, needs you an need NPU. A, you need an NPU, I think. Or a GPU, frankly, right? I well, mean, that's what Nvidia is uh, saying. But they're the thing. I, well, I mean, all of the offline, local run solutions have been optimized against nvidia for years now i mean it's that may change over time but for now right i mean this is kind of the you know it's kind of a good way to do it so microsoft will commercialize this or whatever is something called OneDrive, a copilot for OneDrive. um i there's no way that uh gemini for google workspace won't do the same thing right uh it may not today and i don't think it does but this is coming and so people who are on workspace, you know, for business or uh, have a Google one subscription where they pay another 20 bucks a month, uh, will be able to do this against their Google drive. Right. I mean, it's, it's coming. So, I mean, based on how fast it's coming, it's probably going to be here before next week's show. So, you know, hold on to your seats. <laughs> no, it really, it's, it's, it's astonishing how it, you, you, we, <laughs> we keep saying like, it, we can't get used to how fast this is happening. Yeah. And then a week goes by and it's like, I, it's happened. It's still, it's still going. Well, I, I don't the, understand how this is possible. That's the thing that scares people is that they, you know, that it's going to somehow reach some sort of hockey stick growth thing. And then. Yeah. <laughs> Stephanie, can she make us a drink? We have uh, people here um, who I'll ask her that. Yes. We, I mean, we're, Rich's not going to be here. So we're probably going to need a cocktail if it's okay. <laughs> this I like. No, right now, no, no. It's, it's right right now, we need a cocktail. <laughs> this uh, I like. No, we've had uh, ongoing issues with our water heater. Oh, okay. and unexpectedly, okay. they have come arrived uh, to fix it ten feet away from my head. All right. So anyway, don't worry about. Um, it. Just keep on no, going. Right. Keep on going. That's right. <laughs> so uh, there was an Intel event today, and Microsoft CEO Satya Nadella showed up to say, and very again, very vaguely, just like the Xbox thing. We are going to use the Intel Foundry. Uh, they have that 18A process they've been talking about that will start shipping in the second half of this year uh, for, they said A chip, right? So Microsoft, remember back in November, announced two custom AI chipsets. Uh, one was a CPU and one was a GPU, Azure Maya and Azure Cobalt. Almost certainly going to be one of those chipsets. By the way, these were ARM designs, if I'm not mistaken. I think both of them were. Uh, but they're going to use the Intel 18A manufacturing process which will be their most advanced ever when it ever launches. And they say they're still on track. Um, and Intel had a bunch of other announcements around this. I mean, they have uh, a bunch of other CPU architectures and things happening, but you know, they're trying to drum up what they say so far has been $15 billion in manufacturing commitments for the foundry business. They're looking at getting another 10 billion from the United States and subsidies, right. For the chips and science act. Um, and Intel's uniquely positioned to take advantage of that. They're the only ones who are like, we're building stuff here. Let's do it. You know, so a little vague. We don't know exactly what form that's going to take, but um, they did announce it. Um, this has not been formally announced and they refuse to <laughs> acknowledge it. But uh, OpenAI went through another round of 
is a specific kind of funding. It is a, uh, what's it called? Uh, da, 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 da. When you're a private company, you get tender offers, right? So this is a way for uh, investors to invest in your company when you're not public, right? Um, so based on this, the value of those shares, this company is now uh, worth $86 billion, right? Wow. Um, which is almost triple the number it was less than a year ago. And that's how fast AI is doing things, right? This is the incredible nature of this thing. A um, couple of other things related to money in open AI. Uh, they're looking at other funding. It's, they should be worth over $100 billion within a month or two. And Sam Altman, the CEO who was deposed and came back, uh, has been talking <laughs> about this a lot publicly, right? He's trying to raise billions of dollars to help fund the manufacturing of a open AI specific AI chipsets, right? They're trying to do their yeah, own chips. Seven trillion dollars. You're going to need AI just to express these numbers. Seven so big. trillion. I don't know what he's going to do yeah. with seven trillion dollars. He's going to build a lot of chips and then he's going to dominate the world, I think is his idea. And um, that's evil yeah. villain money. I mean, that's. I know. It's James Bond. It's James se Bond villain. Seven yeah. trillion. Yeah. That's like a. That's yeah. like the. You twirl your mustache. Budget. You stroke your Cheshire <laughs> cat. You get your eye patch going. This guy, nobody yeah, can so we'll, accuse this guy of amb lack of ambition. That's all I can say. I know. Wow. It's, it's incredible. Holy moly. And if you thought this was a scam, I, I would say, if you haven't looked at this, uh, they announced something called Sora. This is their uh, oh, generative that's amazing, AI video tool. Holy God. <laughs> you see this Holy thing? Holy cow. Yeah. I brought my wife. I, I, I said, you have, you have to look at this. I showed it to my wife. I was like, this is, oh my God. So, it, you know, right now it's limited to a minute. It requires a lot of horsepower. They're working with... Uh, Content creators, but also with um, uh, people on the ethical side of, you know, you want to make sure this stuff doesn't, you know, uh, just duplicate Star Wars, <laughs> you know, and then you got uh, Lucasfilm, you know, suing you like you've got the New York Times. But I, it, some of the, obviously it's AI, so there are things, but I mean, it's also video, so you can edit it. And I, I some of this looks amazing. It's incredible. I, it's just, no, all of it looks amazing. Yeah. So do look at that if you haven't. It is incredible trying to pull it up um, here but uh yeah some of the uh, right I, this is like you know the uh, the woman walking on the streets of tokyo at night is one of the really good ones the the two little pirate ships uh floating in coffee <laughs> which is pretty classic uh the and mammoths, these are all from text know, text prompts that's what's amazing text right? prompts yeah yep. this is not there's not they're not giving you giving them film or something it's text right. prompts that's right. incredible um i have it but i'm trying i can't Oh, I'm in trouble getting my computer to show it to people. I want to show you this. It's so cool. All right. Well, you can go to, you know what? Go to therot.com and read the article. He's got a link to it. And you can, uh, we'll probably, it's, we'll probably be talking about this on, um, uh, yeah, it's on no twig. Way. No, it's, in, it's impressive. I mean, stuff. the Dolly improvements where they kind of went from Pixar to photographic quality yes. were, you know, impressive. Um, but this is video. Yeah. You know, yeah. That's what makes this um, so incredible. So this is the prompt. A stylish woman walks down a Tokyo street filled with warm, glowing yeah. neon and animated city signage. She wears a black leather jacket and a long dress and black boots. And that's it. I mean, it's, I know. there it's are AI on. artifacts in it. It's not, it's not perfect. Yeah. People have pointed out little things, you know, and, and yeah, of course. Right. But, the, but this is early days. And by the way, I'm sure this is very calculated, right? This isn't quite ready. Uh, perhaps. But they're also trying to raise a bunch of money. Like, we yeah, I don't think it. you can if use anything, it yet, right? No, no, no individual can go use this. But they're, right. you know, they're working with filmmakers. They're working with that always makes me a little suspicious ethicists. when when they yeah. say that. There was one I saw that was a guy uh, walking on a treadmill, yep. and he, uh, running on a treadmill. We got the prompt wrong because they, oh, okay. they wanted a guy running and then he's also running the wrong way on the treadmill unless there are reversible oh, I treadmills i don't think i've seen those guys at the gym though you know they're not very smart <laughs> running backwards <laughs> yeah this is a wild one it's a tour of an art gallery with beautiful artworks yep. um every one of them copyrighted <laughs> yeah, probably <laughs> right yeah a gray-haired man with a beard in his 60s in deep thought Pondering the history of yeah. the universe, and he sits in a cafe in Paris. Someone just told him he had two years. You know, you, you're, <laughs> you and publisher are going out at the same time, so figure it out. <laughs> Three Wolf Moon. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Three Wolf it's Moon. really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, 
I look forward. It's nuts. Yeah, the problem is because they, they didn't. You can't do it yourself. We don't know how good these are. Maybe this took a hundred different images and tuning and tweaking, and they finally mm -hmm. got the one they wanted. Still, yeah. wow. I know. I know. Wow. Yeah. Um, what is that URL that's next to my name? I'm sorry, <laughs> AndroidIntel.net. Is that? Did I did I put something there by accident, or is that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> I think that's, um, <laughs> just ignore oh, that's the it. windows that's the window oh, those those are my partners but that that's not my website it's <laughs> oh okay okay that's okay gemini yes so well gemini so google has gemini right they announced yep. that in uh december with yep. three different levels different sizes uh they also announced the gemini pro last week 1.5 version which is better than their ultimate or ultra whatever it was called from the 1.0 era which is you know we're quickly leaving behind us because it's been two months after all uh, but these are their proprietary kind of commercial products, right? They charge a bunch of money for people to use these things. And what they've done is they've kind of used that as the basis for smaller LLMs or SLMs, I guess, that can run locally. Um, just like we see around different things. You know, you run them in hugging space, uh, hugging face and so forth. Um, and it's called uh, Gemma, right? So there are two sizes or two versions of that. And this was, a, this was uh, similar to what you were talking about earlier where um, they haven't said what they're going to be, but they're going to make versions of this for very specific use cases, right, uh, in the future. So if you're an enthusiast or a developer or someone wants to get in, this is free. It's open source, I believe. Uh, it, there'll be more. Um, and they're they're kind of, this is their entry. You know, Microsoft has some stuff like this. Um, everyone does, right? Um, so interesting. I thought, you know, they're, they're kind of bringing it down to size here. And again, I... Uh, a further indication of the quick maturation of the stuff. It's kind of crazy. Here is the guy running backwards on the... That's beautiful. Tread I love see, it. treadmills now, don't... See, uh, they don't go that way. <laughs> well, they uh, they might. Uh, I I have seen people on a treadmill backward at the gym. Yeah, but it's, they face the, the other way. They're running backwards. The treadmill's going the normal direction. Yeah. And they have, you have to hold on to the sides because you kill yourself. Right. This, guy's, right. this guy doesn't look like an athlete to What's me. really know. interesting to me is it's the prompt is stepped, step printing scene of a person running cinematic yeah. film shot in 35 millimeters. So the AI added the treadmill. There was no need for that. Oh, there was no call for that. But then the, but look how the camera movement is. It moves it, as if to make it like a handheld. Yeah. Thing. That's it, amazing. Um, this is like the horse video where they proved that all four of its feet actually did yes. leave the ground at the yes. same time. Yes. Yeah. It's really, it's interesting. really fascinating to me. I, I'm so excited by the world. Finally. I know. Because technology was getting a little boring. They're, they're, listen, we, we, people say things and they, they sound like exaggerations, you know. Um, people will talk, this is as big as right. the GUI. It's as big as the internet. I think this is bigger this one than is. all of that This stuff. one is. It's, it's biggest. It's the biggest yep, yet. It really is. I, 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 if you're not getting that yet, I don't know what, how closed your eyes are, but it's all around you. It's just happening. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, look, this is going to be stupid examples. I mean, obviously, AI is going to be... Look, Microsoft is so abusing the co-pilot term that they're going to destroy their best brand in well, 50 years. Well, and that's the, just like the internet, there's good and there's bad. I mean, there's also a flood. Yeah. I think going to be a flood. There already is mm -hmm. of crap. You know, yeah. CNET and others are using this stuff to create junk articles Link bait, right. the the amount of link bait and spam is gonna, yep, skyrocket. I've never used it for writing. I will say, I'm not saying I won't. I mean, I am though, really. I mean, I except that it's moving so fast. I wonder sometimes maybe there's some use for it. I haven't figured out, but obviously I use it for images, right? Um, and I yeah, love it's that. great I for that. Fun. Yeah, those, you that's know, fun. so what if a bunch of artists get thrown out of work? Listen, it's a victimless crime. That's the way I describe <laughs> it, and. uh <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I, mean, I, don't know. I, don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. You know what? Be a better artist than the AI. That's the trick. Make better movies than the AI can make. Write better text than you the AI. It's can not even write. that. It, it, the, here's the problem. Imagine. So, I go to copilot.microsoft.com and I I write in my stupid little prompt. Right. It's always something ridiculous. I want something that looks like the gates to the Garden of Eden, as if painted by uh, by a uh, Renaissance master. Perfect. Uh, except that I want there to be a Google logo on the on the gate. <laughs> Perfect. Because this is an article about Google, right? Perfect. So that thing, it 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 does a little thing. It it, it burp, 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 and I don't know, thirty seconds less, twenty seconds. It's amazing. I have four four images. Yeah. 
Now imagine I went to a human being and I'm like, I'm really concerned ethically about um, getting rid of jobs and yada, yada, yada. And I say to them, I would like the thing I just described. How long would it take that person to create that image? You know, I, this isn't, I'm not, this isn't for a book. It's for a, a news article that I'm going to forget. Well, or a editorial that's not going to matter in about two seconds. You know, like I, it, it's a, I don't recall that. It's like a, the, there's no value in engaging with a human being for something that that's, if that, that is that ephemeral, but once it becomes so easy to do it this other way, then I can use it for that kind of thing. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I think that's the, I mean, the fundamentally, it's like someone could carry me to the restaurant, but we have a bicycle, you know, like it's, it's, I would get there either way, but I, because the other one is so slow, I'm take not the do bicycle. It. I agree. Take the bicycle. You know, I, this does not absolve me ethically. I, I, I no, I mean, we have to resolve these problems. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Listen, we all use iPhones from China. I think we've given up our ethics a long time ago, but <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, I don't know. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a good example of AR or not. I got to be honest. So Adobe, because of what they do and the products they sell, has, is going to have a, a massive imprint on AI. And that stuff's amazing. And and there's all, I feel like every couple of months we see new Adobe innovations. And they, they're they doing it uh, ethically, maybe may not be the right word, but uh, in, a, in, a, in a way that will protect uh, businesses from abusing copyrighted works. You know, they can assure that the content they're training off of is owned by them. And there's, there's something good about that. Right. So I like that. Um, but they've, <laughs> they're adding an AI assistant to Adobe Acrobat. Now the correct response to that sentence is they still make Adobe Acrobat because seriously, if you use that thing without having an Adobe like subscription, it's a giant set of 225 ads. That's all it is. I don't actually think the app does anything. <laughs> Unless you pay them. <laughs> also, I'll just point out that every browser on earth you know, reads PDFs. You don't need it anymore. So you don't. You don't need it. Uh, now, granted, I'm not talking about editing PDFs. That, that gets into some cl uh, some complexities, but I don't know. <laughs> so I would say in the Adobe empire that exists today, Acrobat is their uh, least interesting. The ultimate crapware. It really is. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's too bad. Oh, you just pasted something new in. Oh, no, that was the, oh, that, oh was, that might be Richard. Richard has arrived, dun, perhaps. Dun, dun. I, I see breaking Llama Soft, oh, the that. Jeff Minter oh, story. Yeah, so <laughs> that came right before. Well, we'll get to that. Let's, <laughs> okay, get there. We'll get to get, well, that's we'll in the get Xbox ahead. segment. All right. Okay. Yes. Okay. Continue on. Well, oh, we're yes, done with AI. Actually do we're done with that AI. That does bring us. All right. That does bring us All to right, uh, Let's get to Xbox. It's Xbox time. Yeah. So we actually talked about this earlier. So I'll just briefly mention again that uh, Microsoft has been talking about this notion of game preservation and how this might look in the future. Obviously, the goal on Xbox as a console is to try to have that backward compatibility play. They've done a great job on Xbox One and now Series X and S in giving um, customers the ability to access these games across generations. Um, the problem with older games, of course, is that you might run into technical issues. Publishers were not interested in doing the work, that they don't see the value of it. And so for the older games, 360 OG especially, um, we hit the wall on that. Like we're we're pretty much done with those. I'm not saying there won't be any further on maybe 360, but OG definitely is over. But what does this look like in the future, right? Because as as Xbox expands to include subscriptions and cloud streaming or cloud gaming, I guess. Um, what about game preservation there? And uh they've he's talked about it, you know, a little bit vaguely, but there, uh, later this year, there should be some form of your game library uh, being played in the cloud, which will make it, you know, truly universal or as universal as, as it can be. Uh, and then, you know, it's the second half of the month. This is a short month. Um, we have more um uh, game pass games that are arriving uh, in the next two weeks. You know, Madden NFL 24, big one everyone's heard of. Warhammer, right? There's another big one. And then a bunch of crap I've never heard of and what's happening, I don't know anymore. So I'm really hoping <laughs> that, well, Activision Blizzard is going to change this. I keep saying it, but uh, now we know that won't happen until the very end of March at the earliest. So there's going to be a beautiful day in March where we say you can play Diablo 4. I'm excited um, about that, although I did pay for Diablo 4. So I really, yeah, I really like the, I, I can't wait to see what this looks like. 
Uh, I hope it doesn't come with a resulting price increase because you know, we'll Madden 24, that's good. Madden 24 is a good one, yeah. yeah. Or at least a big, famous, well-known one. Um, you know, when we get into things like uh, virtual fishing, uh, it's like, I don't yeah, know. Tales oh, no, of, it's man, yeah, that's a bit. Tales of man Mars. Eater. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't think I want to Tales play Tales of Mars, I think that's <laughs> a rise, that by the way. Oh, uh, different kind of game. Yeah, different. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to play that. Uh, Bolt yeah. Gun. Mm. You know, is that's where you take out the cow at the end? Is that the you're like the last guy in the? Oh yeah, <laughs> is that what that is? <laughs> that's it. Know. Cattle stunner. But hopefully, that's not. my next cattle, game. Cattle stunner. cattle stunner. How many cattle could you stun in an hour? <laughs> Jeez. All right. I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> Continue. Uh, Microsoft has been kind of vocal here, and and they admitted that they're actually working with regulators in the EU to kind of you know. To explain why what Apple's doing is not okay, perhaps all of them. But he, although I will say, he made a really good point. You know, he said, he said, you know, Apple has the best user interface designers in the world. So when they release software with has a really bad user interface, you have to know it's premeditated, right? That they, that they kind of dictated it had to be like this. You know, Apple, their thing is like we've hundreds of Apple team members who spent tens of thousands of hours working on this thing. Yeah, it's hard to circumvent the law. You know, like you know, I think that's. I'm sure it took a lot of time, but. Anyway, we'll see how that one comes out. I, I I just find it interesting that Microsoft has overtly decided to, um, you know, kind of take a stand. And on Meta, this one. so and Meta. Yeah, Meta yeah. doesn't surprise me. There's no love lost. You know, you got to remember, like when uh, was it iOS 16 or 17, whatever version, where they put in that uh, "Don't track me across app" thing. You know, Meta, like their uh, revenue on the iPhone, like plummeted. That's a good point. And, uh, that was kind of a shot across the bow, wasn't it? <laughs> that was that was directed at Meta specifically, right? And because that's their business model, you know. And uh, I didn't, I you know, we don't cover this part of the industry per se, but I, and I only half read the story because I don't really care that much. But uh, I think it was, I think, I think it was. I don't remember if it was Mark Zuckerberg. Somebody said that maybe it's just a source was saying like they're actually alerting advertisers like, look, we're not going to make any money on the iPhone, so. Let's let's do it in different ways. Wow. You know, like they're it's almost like they're actively trying to undermine the iPhone now. Which so, I mean, that makes sense in some ways. But yeah, those two well, companies hate each other. As you know, I guess in a way, it's a good point that you're not operating in a vacuum. Apple yep. or Meta or Microsoft or anybody, we're all in this together. And so, if a company really starts to act poorly, right, you're going to well, get some resistance. Okay. This is an interesting ethical question, right? I think objectively, most people would agree that silently or non-silently, whatever, tracking people in the background, watching their activities, storing their information, binning it together, selling it to advertisers so that they can target you with personalized recommendations, right? Take advantage of you in that way is, uh, you know, it's a little shady, right? It's not great. Easy. Um, yeah. But- is it on Apple to make the decision that that business model of one of their biggest partners is unacceptable and they're just not going to allow it anymore, even though they do exactly the same thing, by the way? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is kind of a, it's an, it's an interesting gray area where the, uh, you know, this gatekeeper in this case, we'll call him is, has become like the policeman and the judge and the jury and the executioner. They, they're, they've just unilaterally decided we're doing, you know, your business model stinks and we're not going to allow it. It's, not illegal, um, you know. By the way, maybe it should be. And I guess and the, the data EU, brokers maybe it's becoming, put the data brokers out of business. Then yeah. we can talk. You know, yeah, it's, it's interesting. About I, I, them. I'm, I'm not coming out on any side here. I'm just it's it's a uh, as we say. I'm just asking questions, <laughs> which which just want to know one way That's to all. identify yourself as a jerk up. Um, but <laughs> I hear I did, people I'm saying. Joking. That Paul, yeah. I hear yes, know. yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm just saying, as violence on both sides. I don't know. <laughs> I'm asking questions. <laughs> Anywho, uh, after saying they wouldn't do it, Epic came out last week and said, "Yeah, we're going to build a game store on iOS in Europe." Um, there's no way they can make any money on it. I feel like they're just doing it out of spite. And you know what? God bless them. I don't care. That's fine. Um, I, 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 the more realistic outcome here, or maybe the more realistic excuse for what they're doing is that they feel like what they've done, they Apple have done so far to appease the DMA is not going to fly with regulators and that those rules will change and they'll be in place to have their store, which in fact will make sense when the fee structure is different. So, oh, that's an interesting again. gamble. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. It really is. But it's a big market. See this. Remember, we talked up front about 
the relative size of the console market and the um, uh, the mobile market, you know, the PC market is roughly the same size as the console market. It that's where Epic Games plays today in with their own store. But of course, their most popular games are on mobile, right? So, so things like Fortnite, and I they they can see the horizon of you know if we do this thing i oh. mean this is going to be exponentially bigger Fortnite's for us right? where the money is they made billions yep. and billions in one that's year right. so that's it that's why i mean honestly you could almost call it we're just going to make the Fortnite store i mean might as well just call it what it is but obviously they hope to have other games that will you know have a similar level of success but very interesting um and you know i've said this a bunch of times in the past 10 seconds we'll see the problem and is that just be, you, Apple sorry. takes twenty seven cents, at a, so right. it's not like no. They're hope they're they're assuming that's going to stop right. That 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 is violating the spirit of this thing. The the point of it wasn't that you keep collecting all the money. The right. point was right. you, you actually open up the platform. Right. We'll see. We'll see. A lot of debates these days around uh, spirit versus the letter of the law. We've all become EU legal scholars. Apparently, I, we all know a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, when Microsoft was in antitrust court in the late 1990s here in the United States, I had to learn about antitrust laws and how those things actually work. Right. And you still get into debates about, with people about uh, what constitutes a monopoly. You know, at what point is it acceptable or not acceptable for a company to behave in a certain way? These are still because it's very vague. It's it's very hard to, um, you know, say, look, it's, it's very explicit. It's this thing. You know, it's hard. Yeah. So. Before, right as we were starting the show, like five minutes before, I got an email about this and uh, the game documentary, you know, that interactive documentary series, uh, Llama Soft, the Jeff Mintner story is coming out on PC, Xbox, PlayStation and Nintendo on March 13th. And this is that second game slash documentary series, whatever, uh, from the company me, that brought us the carrot. Who, Sorry. who is who is Jeff Mintner? Yeah. He is the guy that made, uh, he made 42 games okay, wow. across the 80s and 90s on classic platforms, you, you know, typically back in the day, Apple, uh, Commodore, et cetera. Um, the company that's doing this is Digital Eclipse. They were bought recently by Atari because Atari has now, the, the thing that is Atari today, has kind of dedicated itself to retro gaming. Um, before that purchase, they had made that making of Carrot Carrot. <laughs> Karateka, Jesus, uh, uh, which was unbelievable, right? So he made such games as uh, Sheep in Space, Attack of the Mutant Camels, uh, Hellgate, Laser Zone. He wrote games that ran on the Zin, uh, Sinclair, CX81, that what we saw here in the US. Oh, my God. Wow. Sinclair. They must have been the like, Spectrum. They must have been text games almost, right? No, they were, well, they were, <laughs> they like were high resolution games. games. Yeah. Uh, but no, Vic 20 and 64, Atari 8 bits, uh, ST, Jaguar, right? A um, lot, a lot of stuff. So this thing is going to have a remastered version of his Commodore 64 game Gr Grid Runner, which I actually owned back in the day. Um, modern graphics and sounds. So it's going to be a virtual museum of design documents. You know, the documentary we, we expect now, the bunch of other video features, et cetera. So they had announced that this was going to be the second um, game. I think it was late last year, right? Yeah, or December, yeah, early December last year. Um, it will be available on... Those platforms, like I said, but also through uh, uh, Good Old Games or whatever that's called now, GOG.com uh, for PC users. So uh, there's always these things always have awesome. I love you know, this so spe much. I, special I features. And, yeah. Love this idea. So good. An interactive do documentary. It's just perfect for yep. the medium. I really think yeah. this is great. It's the right, you know, look, the, the, <laughs> Um, the people who were around at the beginning of this industry, like I was, uh, were kids then and are, you know, advanced adults now, uh, we have money and we, we have nostalgia and we would, <laughs> we're very interested in this stuff. I think this is smart. So plus it will introduce these games, which are, to us are classics, uh, to a older generation, right. Of gamers who don't have access to play them on those. And these, and these people, these guys like Jeff Minter deserve the attention because yeah, I mean, they were, you know, they were pioneers. They're pioneers. Yeah. And it, it were, it's like cinema. I mean, this was the early days of cinema. This was the mm -hmm. early days of it. And uh, great stuff. Really cool. 
I don't think they. they when got I said I was uh, an certain. advanced adult, I meant like an age, not in. Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're very good at being an adult now. Well, you're in the advanced. I hope that was clear. I'm a, I, I'm, <laughs> I, I careen in and out of adult behavior. <laughs> I'm an advanced adult in a very mental <laughs> way. Uh, yeah. Minter uh, and Lamasoft really were f mostly uh, English, right? So it's it's. Uh, kind yeah, of, kind I, of, I, yeah. These were. I mean, look. I, <laughs> In when I was uh, whatever I was at the time, 12, 14 years old, these games were quirky and weird, right? Right. No, which made it well, Grid Runner wasn't, but I mean, right. the, a lot of the Lamasoft stuff was very strange. And, um, but that was, you know, it was a great era of uh, really advancing or quickly advancing technology, experimentation. Um, and, you know, just like we see today, there, there's a lot of Me Too type games from that era, like a bunch of stuff that looked just like Space Invaders, a bunch of stuff that looked just like whatever. And, uh, and then there were these kind of like a little more, you know, quirky and unique games and uh, you know, pushing the boundaries was good. He's, he's still around, which is kind of, I mean, I'm on his website. Yeah. This is why it's also a good time to do this stuff, right? Because these guys who were right. making right. these games, uh, this, this there, there are other efforts sort of related to this. You know, the guy who did the Prince of Persia games. And, uh, and I'm forgetting the other big game he had. He's written Jordan books Mechner. about his two biggest. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. two biggest titles. Like there, there's a lot of content uh, all of a sudden, and it's really neat. They're the guy who wrote the Atari uh, ET game uh, and was part of that documentary that Xbox put out has a book out that's fantastic. And it, th this is a great time for this kind of stuff. It's really neat. <laughs> no one who's ever met a llama would ever name anything after, after this. After a llama? Well, this guy, is, uh, this guy actually raises, yeah. raises llamas. Well, they're horrible animals. That's just so. In his bio, he says uh, he's living. Um, where is it? It's yeah, like in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I live in Where's beautiful surroundings in rural West Wales with oh, my geez. partner Giles, four sheep, two goats, two llamas, and a small mad border collie named after a curry. <laughs> There's no yak in this. <laughs> no, his name uh, is Yak. Is, he's is Yak. Nothing like a he's Yak. yak. He's Yak. That's the funny thing. It's funny you should say that. That's his pseudonym. Jeff Minter is, that his name? is really? Yak. Are you kidding me? Yes. Oh my God, that's hilarious. So, I was gonna if I was gonna create a software company in the early nineties, I was gonna call it Yakware. And I have a, well, a fun little cartoon logo of a yak. There you go. And that's why that's why I made that joke, not because of it's his, I do that. he calls that's himself funny. a yak, so he's with you. He's okay. right there with you. Hmm. And he even has virtual reality games. The new frontier. Wow. They're working on it. Anything for uh, Holland? No, probably not. no. Not even Hololens. Not even <laughs> Polybius is going to be uh, wow. Polybius is going to be a. This is even this game, which is for a PS5, looks yeah. old, right? Yeah, it, right. It does. Yeah, that's cool. I like the good old hmm. days. I do, I do too. That's why I want VR to take off, so I could just kind of succumb to it. Yeah, I'll just <laughs> bathe you know. in it. Yeah. Yep. I'll just be I'll bathe into the, good the couch. Old days. Well, speaking of good old days, it's just Paul today, which means the back of the book will feature just his tip of the week and app pick of the week. And if Stephanie comes through, <laughs> we might have a drink, a cocktail of the week. But before we get to that, I want to take a little time out and mention our club. We have such a great group of people in our uh, club, Twit. 11,306 now. Uh, not all of them are in the Discord, but a lot of them are. That's a great place to hang. The Discord is kind of the clubhouse of Club Twit. And it's not just uh, talking about shows that are currently on. It's talking about anything that geeks would be uh, interested in. Um, I mean, everything. I, I spend a lot of time in the Advent of Code section where we talk about coding and things. But there's so much there. That's not all, though. If you're a member of Club Twit, you also get ad-free versions of all of our shows. You, uh, we, you know, for a long time I said you, you get shows we don't put out anywhere else. Well, we've changed that a little bit. We now put out audio versions of everything we do, including your show, Paul, hands on Mac, hands on the Windows. Uh, but just a video is just available in the club. So if you want to watch Paul uh, on the hands on Windows show, you got to be in the club. But you can listen to it, and we think that's good because that way people can kind of hear iOS today, hands on Macintosh, hands on Windows, the Untitled Linux show, which has never been in public, uh, Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, 
you can hear those shows. And if you decide you want to, we want to give you a little incentive to join the club. If you decide you want to support Twit with your $7 a month contribution, you can get the uh, video versions <clears throat> as well. Discord, ad-free versions of all the shows, video of all the shows, uh, stuff come that happens before and after shows, additional content like that. All of that for 7 bucks a month. But the real thing you're doing here is the, the thing I really think I always wanted to do which is had to have a, a, a podcast network supported by its listeners. Uh, we, you know, we started that way. Maybe I don't know if people remember that, but we started that way, but the infrastructure wasn't there. There was no Patreon. We used Memberful and Patreon company. There was no Memberful. Uh, we had a PayPal tip jar, you know, uh, and it wasn't enough money to grow like I wanted to grow the network. I could do maybe one show and that's it and no studio or anything. So we did start doing advertising and that's been very good to us over the last 19 years advertising has helped us build studios expand our offerings pay great hosts like paul but advertising starting to dwindle for podcasting for a variety of reasons most of which i don't really understand so we really are kind of moving back to that old model of you know what we would like to really be supported by our audience and here's our we've been doing this for a couple of years it's growing great we'd like to grow more Right now, uh, 11,000 members is, well, we have about 750,000 uniques a month. So what is that? That's that's 2%. It's a small percentage. If we get that to 5%, if we get that to 10%, uh, we would not need advertising and we could expand. We could add shows. We could pay our hosts more. Um, and I would like to do that. So with your help. If only if only two out of fifty, two out of a hundred are you, of you are paying, that leaves ninety eight people who are not members of the club. That maybe is you. Twit.tv slash club twit. Be one of the few, the proud, the smart who support this network. And I do thank you very much in advance for that support. Uh, we will come back with the back of the book and Paul Thorat in just a moment. Back of the book time. It's all you, Paul. Tip of the week. Yeah. So in the Microsoft space here, we're all very well aware of the book Showstopper <coughs> by Z, uh, Zach, what was it? Zachary Pascal. G. Pascal Zachary. Zachary. G. Pascal Zachary. Great oh, book. Sorry. By the way. Wonderful. Right. Try, try here. But that was about NT. Yes. That was, that's but it's about the creation of Windows NT. Yeah. So as it turns out, there's a book about this, a book like this about Android called Androids. Oh, excuse me again. The author of that book is now leaving. Actually, I think it's 14 years, not 18. But uh, but he, the author of that book, Chet Haas, uh, was not there at the beginning of the creation of Android, but he was there at the beginning of the Android's bit when they were in Google. And he's been there ever since. And he interviewed all of the primary players in Android to write this book. So it's kind of, you know, the definitive history of that time period. I mention it now because he's leaving the co uh, company. Interestingly, he's leaving it to go into... Uh, comedy, like TV writing. <laughs> okay. Is, I guess he's a comedian. I know, I know. Okay. Um, but, well, good uh, luck. But you that, know, yeah, I guess you he's, got that you know, good Google good. money. You don't really need to make a living. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I, I, I bought this book when it first came out uh, many years ago, and um, I just went and looked at it again, and it's available in an Audible version. So I just purchased that. I'll oh, listen to it on the way home yeah. uh, from Mexico, and as I walk around here. But um, yeah, it's a great book, and. Um, it's also available in Audible if you have a credit to spare, um, like I do. Nice, so, cool. Yeah. Is it is it funny? Uh, was yeah. it, I mean, is there anything any anything that it's uh, not a, it's not a laugh out riot? If that's it's not the Martian. I'm just wondering why Chet you know, thinks that maybe his next big well, thing would be writing <laughs> comedy. I don't. Well, he's been doing this on the side for a long time, actually. Oh, okay. right. So he's uh, and he's been going back to school for this. Uh, he's taking he classes in the past. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Good for him. We all have different little life skills. I. He was actually, you know, when you see something like this, you think what you're going to see is something. Any indication, like oh, Google's changed and blah blah blah. I can't, you know, nothing. You know, he just he loves Google. He loves everything great. Although. He's always thought of himself more as a uh, someone on the Android team. And actually, if you follow his career arc, it's kind of interesting because he he shot up the ranks. And he's like, I, I don't want to program more. And he went back down the ranks specifically on, you know, to write more code. You know, 
he wanted, he's honestly, I don't know the person, I mean, but based on what he's written about himself, I mean, it's very clear he uh, had things he wanted out of life and and didn't care if he took a pay cut or a job title cut or whatever. Uh, and now he's leaving Google because this is what he wants. So I, I respect that. Nice. Good for yeah. you. Quitter. Jeff. I shouldn't, no. yeah, I shouldn't knock it. That's great. And I would like to announce that I am going to be quitting my job here at the Twit Network to become a house yeah. painter. It's something I've yep. always dreamt of. I've always wanted to do. Uh, I'm taking if a you class. you could learn how to fix water heaters, I actually oh, have a need for that right good now. Good money. Uh, I could be your first client. Good money in that. Good money. Yep. App pick of the week. <laughs> yeah. So about a year ago, I uh, picked a password manager. I went to Bitwarden and I didn't really regret it. It's it's worked out pretty well. So it's kind of technical, but I, I like the whole open source. It was actually, it's free. should mention I mean, they're a sponsor just, you know, for the disclaimer. Okay, that was the disclaimer. That. Um, yep. Okay. That wasn't why, but I, you know, they, they worked out well. But toward the end of the year, I started getting to the security stuff. I went down that rabbit hole where Microsoft had added support for passkey management to Windows 11, which triggered this and that. And I, I, I just went down this path. And as it turns out, all major password managers are talking about passwordless. And in, in this case, I mean, accessing the password manager itself in a passwordless fashion. Um, all of them support it to some degree. Some of them require you to start a new account and it's in beta, whatever it was. I, I had bad experiences with both Bitwarden and 1Password, which are generally considered to be some of the best ones. Um, and I talked to a couple of security experts and uh, eventually I tried Dashlane, which offers a passwordless account. Uh, hmm. You have to sign in for the first time on mobile and it works like Brave uh, Sync works. You uh, once you have one device, you use that to okay you on the next device. You kind of create this chain. And of course, because I review so many laptops, and I, I think I probably set this thing up on 117 different computers and devices. So it's worked out great. Um, the passwordless stuff is real. It's fantastic. Um, it's not passkey based, which I think is a plus, <laughs> frankly. But it, the point is, it's passwordless. And uh, and it supports passkeys. So actually, one, it, one of the things they do, this is not a standard yet, but... When you save a passkey to your computer, because this thing is the password manager, it offers to save it to itself rather than to, com yeah. to the computer. Bitwarden and does it, that, that too, which I really yeah, like. That's it a neat me. feature because it, yeah. it makes it portable. Right. right. So now my Bitwarden, my, I log into GitHub with Bitwarden. It's really a great yeah. way. To, yeah. It's nice. Yeah. And you only have to do it the one time. And now it's it, so all you have to awesome. do is install the thing yeah. elsewhere. And then it's. I wish more right. websites supported that. So. Here's what I wish for passkeys, um, that more websites supported it, uh, them uh, consistently. Um, right. there, I, I've gotten into it. Like, for example, I would have, I bet two months ago, I would have said something like, I really like the way Google does it. They, they put it in front of you. Um, they kind of force you to deal with it. If you're on Windows, they, there's this thing in Chrome where it will, uh, you can protect your pass, their password manager with Windows Hello, which I think is a neat uh, thing to do, a smart thing to do. But... <laughs> But I get into the situation. This, well, there's problems, right? So I'm testing uh, a Samsung Galaxy phone that I'm going to review, right? It can't, for its camera, when I pointed at a, a cap, a, um, a QR code for Google, yeah, just all it does is make a URL. It doesn't go, it doesn't do a passkey. Mm. And if you have set up a Google passkey, the number of steps you have to take to do 2FA without using that passkey is like 17. And you can't, unless it's buried somewhere in your account settings up in the cloud. I haven't looked at yet, but um, on that PC device, whatever it is, you can't say for, like, please, like the simplest thing to me is send a code to my phone, right? Cause I've got the Google authenticator app on all my devices. That thing syncs those things. It works great. No, I have to, every time I get prompted with the QR code, I can't use this camera for it. I say, no, or does it try into the way? Can I do it? it it's like this crazy I, it, it's like you're digging yourself out of a hole and it's a God, it happens again because of all the devices and everything. And think about a, I, I review laptops. Oh, I install four or five browsers on a laptop. So that's four or five times as many times as every time I sign into Google, no, you know, you know it goes to the whole, it's awful. Anyway, Dashlane solves that problem too. So that's kind of neat. So it's not pass keys, but it is password lists. And, and I think that's job one, uh, <laughs> for security that is both uh, you know, actually secure and um, convenient. Nice. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I look forward to a day. <clears throat> well, I don't have to enter another password. We all do. Someday. Um, I have a couple of extra uh, app picks because Rich is not here. Um, 
Firefox 123 came out, version 123 came out this week. Um, two features. One of these I find vaguely amusing. Um, one is uh, they've added search to Firefox View. If you don't use Firefox View, that's that extra mini tab in the left corner there where it shows you your kind of history. You can go through all your stuff across devices, right? So if you use your Firefox account, Mozilla account now across devices, uh, it will, you know, it's a way to get to content that you were looking at on other computers. Now you can just search with that. So not a big deal there, but obviously necessary. And then they have, because they don't use Chromium and the whole web is kind of, you know, oriented itself around Chromium, they added a web compatibility reporting tool. So when you, if you run into an issue with a website, you can report it to uh, Mozilla and they'll work on their rendering engine to make sure that gets fixed. So there you go. Nice. Um, I recommended this first back in uh, probably December at the end of the year. I used to use something called, um, actually, I forgot the name of it. <laughs> it doesn't matter. So who cares? Um, but I, I, I use it as a homepage. <laughs> Screw it. I don't want like it anymore. Sorry, momentum. momentum. I paid okay. for it. Uh, as a kind of a homepage thing on all my browsers. Um, I use this new thing uh, called Bonjour. So it's Bonjour, the French word with two R's at the end, because I guess they stutter or something. And it's free, open source, privacy focused, minimalist, a beautiful photo switches throughout the day. Um, it does everything I want and now it does more. And I've actually, since I wrote this article, I actually implemented a bunch of this new stuff. So they have those links at the bottom, like quick links, like we see in other browsers, right? And there's a bunch of new features related to those. You can have uh, folders. You can have pages of those things. We have buttons on the bottom, so you switch between them. So that's one of the ones I did. You can do bookmark sync. So if you had a bookmark to your browser, it goes into uh, your homepage thing here oh. now as well. Uh, I love this. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. I gave them, I, it's free. I donated some money today because I love them so much. And it works everywhere. It. So there's nice. versions for Chrome and Chromium. There's versions for Firefox. There's versions for Safari if you're a Mac user. Um, so it's pretty much everywhere you want it to be. And um, this is the kind of thing I use. I, I Like I said, I used Momentum before. I like this one better. Um, beautiful. It's really nice. Nice. Yep. There we go. And it's super configurable. Like you're, you're looking at it now. If you can see it on the screen, it's kind of the, yeah. the base, you know, config. But um, there's all kinds of stuff you can do to customize this however you want it. It's really, really nice. Really and the cool. imagery is really nice, too. Yeah. yeah. Changes. Uh, it comes. You can get it from Unsplash or local mm -hmm. files. Actually, yep. I'm going to do my local um, desktop files because yeah. I have quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, that's cool. I like this. Yeah, it's a really nice yeah. uh, homepage. Bonjour. And I don't, you know, everyone everyone browses differently or whatever, but I, I stopped using bookmarks a long time ago, but I do have these links I use every day, you know, uh, just as a matter of course for work, et cetera. I have certain tabs that I pin to all my browsers, you know, so I created a page of just those. So I don't have to type, you know, so for me, it's, you know, Google, uh, Gmail, Google Calendar, Twitter, Mastodon, which is twit.social. And then recently I've added Blue Sky and uh, LinkedIn just to kind of, you know, keep track of that kind of stuff because I stupidly own a company like an idiot and, um, <laughs> you know, trying to figure that out. So, but now, you know, it's much easier to set that stuff up again, right? So it's nice. nice. Yeah, I just added some Not, uh, some of my bookmarks that I go to a lot. That's nice. Sync yeah. new ones, link pages. That's nice. Open a tab. Right. Wow, very impressive, and it's free. Yep. Reminds me of the uh, good old days of uh, what were some of those home pages that we used to do, like uh, my Two Yahoo cities. and yeah, no, no. <laughs> I like, used to remember? use uh, it was a my Google my dot Google dot my, com, my Google mistaken. maybe there was my Yahoo. Yep. There's yep. still Start Page, I think. Still people, some people use that. Sure, you know, custom page. And if you hate yourself, just use Microsoft Edge and keep it on its there default page. It's a it's beautiful. a bully base of crap. It's a work it's, of love art. <laughs> it's, it's the All online right. service equivalent of the browser you're using. Let's uh, let's. Okay. Stephanie has come through. Yeah. So With, now, th to be clear, this is not. She did not invent this cocktail, but you can Google this. There's uh, one of the unexpected benefits of Mexico City is that some of the top bars in the world are here. And the one we like the most, then we go to the most, is called Baltra. It's about the size of our bathroom. It's really small. Um, and But they have incredibly inventive cocktails. And oh, one nice. that we both get a lot, quite a bit, actually, is called Sumi. And you can see the picture of it there. But it's, uh, you know, gin and oh. violet liqueur, jasmine syrup, uh, yuzu, which is a kind of a like a Asian citrus fruit, I guess. 
uh, an egg white, but you can tell from the foam at the top there. And then they always garnish it with uh, dried flowers. Lovely. It's, just, it's beautiful. Lovely. And that drink you can sort of see in the back that's green is... Um, straight a tequila mezcal. based taco that oh, okay. I, no it's tequila in this case but there's a mezcal version as well and uh, that's amazing too their, their cocktails are amazing and it's one of the few places this is a weird one so, so a place as cosmopolitan and uh, as just as humongous as Mexico City I, if I walked into a bar 20 different bars and said I'd like a Manhattan I can tell you that I get more confused looks to that question than I get to the no bread question I was joking about earlier I, it's hard to find a place that even understands what this is. You know, it's one of the most common cocktails in the world. That's so weird. But when I walk into Balter and say, well, when they said, do you want it straight up or do you want it in the rocks? I'm like, I love you people. <laughs> exactly. Balter one is the, one of just, the world's best 50 best bars. Yes. It's always in the top. Unbelievable. The top always. Yep. What the, always and you get, this is your neighborhood bar. You could walk there in 15 minutes. It's unbelievable. Oh, you are living a life. Ball they don't even ask me anymore. When I go in there, they're literally like, all right, you want a Manhattan? What would you like? You know, <laughs> pretty, they're fantastic. Pretty bueno. Pretty bueno. Are, they, are they going along with the, with the new language, the pretty bueno language? So I have, uh, that would, I've not tried that there actually. <laughs> but, um, I bet very they nice. Yeah, they're very pretty, nice people. Pretty bueno. <laughs> this, this kind of reminds me i think it was like an arrested development joke right the guy was like, no 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 it's uh it's a uh, curb your enthusiasm oh, no. the guy from side the guy who did seinfeld yeah, it's, uh, yeah larry david it's curb uh, your enthusiasm yeah, 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 that's what it is. Pretty, yeah pretty yeah <laughs> yeah yeah right that's that's kind of how i say it <laughs> so that's what yeah it's from larry david yeah yep. <laughs> mr paul Therot, look at that all by himself he lifted this show on his own broad oh, shoulders. another Richard failure. I don't know what we're going to do with that guy. <laughs> Richard's no, is still I'm in sorry. transit, I'm sure. He wanted so badly to be I here. know. He hates missing the show, but he'll, you know, he'll yeah. be here next week. Uh, mm -hmm. You will also be here next week. Mm -hmm. I will be here next week. I'll try to have the guys come in and do the refrigerator next time. I don't That'd know. be good. I'll, I'll, That'd so, be good. You know. Yeah. <laughs> we weren't expecting them today. That oh, came out that's of nowhere. Fine. You know what? When when they arrive, you welcome them with open arms and you bring them in because who knows when they'll come back. I know. We do Windows Weekly. You know when we do it, you know we're going to be here 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1900 UTC of a Wednesday. That way you can uh, watch, you can enjoy at youtube.com slash twit. Of course, if you're in the club, you can watch in the on the club stage. There's a stage there for the show. After the fact, on-demand versions of this show are at twit.tv slash www. Uh, there's also a YouTube channel dedicated to the videos of this show, youtube.com slash, I think it's Windows Weekly Show, but I can't remember. You, you know, if you go to twit.youtube.com slash twit. YouTube, it's, it's just Windows Weekly. Just Windows Weekly. We own it. Yep. We're awesome. It's also at at Windows Weekly. We'll do it like YouTube yeah, slash yeah, at, at, at uh, Ring the bell, <laughs> hit the button, do the thing. Yeah, all, all the cool kids are doing it. <laughs> I can never get that. Uh, I hate uh, that. so much. <laughs> you can also subscribe in your favorite podcast client. You will find Mr. Therot at therot.com. T-H-U-R-R-O double good.com. Now, become a premium member. It is worth it. Trust me. Great stuff. Uh, lots of free stuff, but there's great stuff behind the paywall. It keeps Paul gainfully employed. Uh, you can also buy his yeah. books, Windows Everywhere, the kind of the history of Windows through its programming languages, and uh, the field guide to Windows 11, including Windows 10. Both of those are at leanpub.com. Calm. Pay as you probably, pay as you probably will. Probably going to just go into TV comedy writing, I guess. I next. think that's I think a, totally let's do it. We'll do a little. Yeah, we could do it. We could do, uh, you know, I did have an idea for a show. It was just going to be me and my friends from high school. It was going to be called Townies. And we're just sitting there at a bar making fun of townies. people. And then people would just sit next to us. So it could be someone different every week. You know, you know, if it's got a Boston accent, it's a guaranteed hit. And and it'll be easy to cast because everybody in Hollywood wants to do a movie with a Boston accent. So you're sad. Wow. And you're I can sad. tell you that none of them can do it accurately. Oh, I'm so sure. Stop. <laughs> I'm sure. Just stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, Paul, thank you so much. We will see you next week. Thanks to all our winners and our dozers. We will see you <laughs> next week right here on Windows Weekly. Bye-bye. <laughs>